Manager Andrew Nada, uh, Councillor Michael Zarella, Councillor Michael Donegan, Councillor Karen Korenthal, Councillor Renu Engelhardt. I'm Mark Schwager, and we have uh, Andrew Tights, our town solicitor, and people behind the scenes whose uh, video is always blank, but who play a very important role are Wendy Schmidl and Don Parry. And tonight, Don Parry is uh, attending his last meeting uh, in his role in the IT department uh, for our town. And I'd like to ask uh, Wendy Schmidl to say a few words and thank Don for his service to our town. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Schwager. I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to acknowledge the tremendous effort that Don provided over the past 11 months. We have implemented and upgraded technology that supports every department. Um, I've known Don for just over 12 years. Uh, with his first work on the town network as a consultant done back in March of 2008. So he's familiar with um, all the ins and outs of the town of East Greenwich. Um, we had a lot of work to be done last year and the stars aligned and we were fortunate to be able to negotiate an agreement to have him join the IT team full time. He was the lead on the in-house engineering that was required on the major projects and assisted us also with the day-to-day -day requests from the departments. Um, in general, it was just a very integral part of the IT team. So his last day is going to be Friday, January 29th as a town employee. You're almost done. Click continue to installation, then click add above to get started. Um, I'm not sure where that came from, <laughs> um, but as Don uh, leaves us uh, for his employment, he has agreed to continue um, if we need him on a consulting basis. Um, so it's important for me to acknowledge his work as part of the team as we both wind down our town employment. Um, I have to tell you that the infrastructure is in an excellent place and will support all the future goals and objectives for the town. So I wanted to thank Don. Thank you, Dr. Schwager. My pleasure. And I would just add to those accolades, Don, that it's been a pleasure working with you. You've uh, been quite an asset to the town and it's great to know that you're still gonna be here. Um, one of these days, I hope we'll actually get to see you on camera, but until then, uh, we wish you well in all your future endeavors. You have any comments, Don? Are you there? Don, it looks like you're there. You have a comment? Well, he Don, we'll no, have to. He has no microphone. <laughs> he just texted me, Dr. Schwager. Okay, I'm so, sorry, Don. Well, we'll have to mic you up sometime in the future, but thanks again very much for your service to our town. And we wish you well and uh, hope to see you at future meetings in your role as a consultant for us. So thanks again. Uh, this brings us to item four, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to raise issues that are not uh, on the formal agenda. Uh, if you would like to make a comment on a uh, item related to town government, please uh, either um, raise your hand on the Zoom platform, or if you're on the phone, you can click uh, star uh, six to raise your hand and then star nine to unmute your microphone. Is there anyone who would like to uh, be recognized for public comment? I see one hand, uh, Steve and Taro. Can we promote uh, the two of them to to the participant field. Good evening, I, Steve, I assume is uh, Steve Lombardi. Yes, it is. Hi, Steve, uh, good evening. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself and then uh, Taro, Mr. Taro or? Yes, Taro my name's Chris, uh, Chris Taro. 
Chris Tarot can, uh, can introduce himself as well. Are you both speaking on the same issue? Yes. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Steve is the, uh, the executive director of our uh, East Greenwich uh, Chamber of Commerce. So Mr. Lombardi, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, make your comments? Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you everybody for allowing these comments. Uh, I'm Steve Lombardi, executive director of the East Greenwich Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here to support our restaurants who have been hit uh, the hardest of any business sector. And uh, they are a very critical part of our East Greenwich business community. And uh, they need our help to <clears throat> survive the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And um, I believe uh, we have at least Chris uh, Taro from Santa on the phone call. We may have some other <clears throat> restaurant owners, but Anyway, I'm here to support them, and I'm hoping that the town of East Greenwich will pass a considered resolution asking for as much state support uh, as possible for our restaurants. And that means uh, sending COVID-19 relief, financial support, such as grants, as soon as possible, uh, without delay, and with an expedite, expedited application uh, process. I'll let uh, Chris, uh, and I'll defer to Chris in terms of the particulars, uh, but I can't uh, say more strongly how much we are uh, in support of um, East Greenwich restaurants and really restaurants throughout the state. They, they are so critical to this state, which is really made up of small business. But with that, uh, I want to thank everybody again for listening and, and really defer to Chris. Uh as I broke my water glass. Sorry about that. If you all heard that. Hello. Hello. Yes. We can hear. Sorry if you heard my water glass broke, but that's okay. I'll get it afterwards. Uh, my name is Chris Tarrow, and I am the co-owner of Sienna Restaurant Group. We currently own three restaurants: one in Smithfield, one in uh, Providence, and of course, one down here in East Greenwich in the Old Benny's Plaza. I don't know when I'll ever say it's not the Old Benny's Plaza because I'm from Rhode Island. I got to start this and say, start first and foremost that uh, over the past almost year now, hard to believe, the town of EG has been great. I've talked to Andy a couple times, uh, expansion of premises, Steve. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, well, I don't want to say it's been a pleasure to deal with you during COVID, but I think you all know what I mean, that it, it's been great. Uh, to give you two seconds of background on me, I am the prior chairman of the Rhode Island Hospitality Camp. Uh, Association. I'm on the board for the Federal Hall Commerce Association. I'm very involved in a small business uh, uh, association that's doing a lot of work behind the scenes. I guess what uh, the restaurants that I speak, you know, I'm a loud Italian, so a lot of times they let me speak, is that we've been kind of forgotten here. Uh, for a while, we had a, uh, and I'm not, this has nothing to do with not believing in COVID. I should say this I was in the hospital with COVID. I, I understand it is dangerous. We are not non-believers saying open us up, open us up, open us up. But what we found is, you know, in late or mid-November, while well, they restricted our hours and that was going to be temporary. And then the pause happened and some of that was going to be temporary. And now we're at a point where we have a governor that has not spoken out in those five weeks on what's happening with the small businesses in Rhode Island. We have a, a state legislator that leg, legislative branch that has not been involved in COVID restrictions, funding, or anything since the start of it. And us small business owners are like, well, what's going on? Do we have to wait for the new governor? Do we have to wait for, uh, we don't know. So we started in Smithfield to get a resolution passed in Smithfield and then uh, passed in Cranston and it's gonna pass in North Providence tomorrow, we assume, to get the local cities to, to stand up and say, if you guys at a state level aren't, you know, being proactive here now that the trend's coming down and things have changed and these were supposed to be temporary, we want to vocally support the small businesses and, you know, start, I think the, the, the big thing in the resolution is getting rid of the time restraints that were supposed to be temporary and now are going into month three uh, with no sight of that ending. Uh, on a, and I, I'm not going to take too much of your time, but just a few things is, I was reading a New York City COVID spread report. 76% of the spread in New York is coming from unstructured 
gatherings, family gatherings. 1.4% is coming from restaurants. So we've really restricted restaurants that are very, if I told you how many hours a day we spent cleaning, how many inspections we had, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars we spent to make it safe in our restaurant. So we have people not going to restaurants, but now going to house parties and unstructured events that I haven't been to a house that has plexiglass yet. I haven't been to a house that has somebody running around sanitizing everything every, you know, constantly. So I think it's time for us to get the restaurants at least back to normal operating hours. And uh, people might say, well, you can operate till 1030. I'm a fine dining restaurant. Does anybody on this Zoom call want to make a reservation for six or eight people at eight o'clock, knowing that they have to be out of where they're going at 1030? Basically, it's not like Target where I can run in one minute before you close. Nobody's coming after two or three hours beforehand. Uh, so it's, it's hurting the businesses. It's hurting our staff. And let's be honest, County East Greenwich counts on maybe 700,000, I think, in 1% sales tax, which we're losing. So all we're trying to do is say, there's no science that says COVID spreads more at 1051 versus 951 versus 851, that as a town legislature, you would say, or council, you'd say, come on, Rhode Island, let's support them, let's open them. We're not saying to raise our capacity to 100%. We're not saying no mass. We're not saying get rid of Plexi. We're just saying at this point that the state has to support us better in opening up the times for all the restaurants. And EG being so restaurant heavy, there's a lot of small business owners like me that are starving or dying. And I would, one of the ones that think that would never happen. I mean, we're in a place, do we ever open Santa Providence again? It was our number one restaurant. That's how much this has affected us. So I guess you understand my position. We could get the resolution written in a way that you'd like with Steve. And, you know, the person that's really run it a lot is uh, Ed Brady, who's on the city council of Cranston. He owns a restaurant. He'd like to be in East Greenwich, but Huck Filling Station is in Warwick, right over the thing. Uh, so that's basically what we got. And, you know, we need your help because I got to be honest with you. I don't know who else I got out there right now. I have a governor that isn't commenting on it. I have a, uh, Senate and Rhode Island legislature are uh, reps that ha aren't making any decisions. And I have a new governor that can't do anything yet. So who's worried about us? I mean that honestly. So that's all I got. If you have questions, you have concerns, anything you'd like to ask me, I can try to answer to the, my best of my uh, ability. And I think a couple more cities that passed this resolution, it's going to put the pressure on the powers to, that can make this happen on a statewide level to at least start talking about it. It's not like you can open us up, but at least you can say, hey, what's going on here? So uh, that's all I have. Well, Mr. Town, uh, thank you very much for your comments and thank you, uh, Mr. Lombardi as well. Uh, this is under the uh, public comments section, so we really can't discuss it as a council, but we can allow a question or two or a comment by the council. Uh, if anyone, I see that Councilor Korenthal did have her hand up. Yeah, I, I understand what he's saying because um, if you have to close your restaurant at 10, 1030, he's correct. Nobody's going to come in at 8, 830 for, for dinner. And I agree with him that the time is uh, too low. And um, I have no problem with, uh, with doing what he asks. So I support him. Uh um, I see our town manager, uh, Mr. Nada, do you have a comment? I do, uh, Dr. Swager, just to get some context to Steve and Chris's comments. So what they're referring to specifically for those who might be listening and not following it as closely, it's executive order 20-95 um, was issued by the governor on November 5th. It specifically states, it's just a couple sentences, that effective Sunday, November 8th, restaurants and bars may serve patrons on site, indoors and outdoors until 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, and until 10.30 p.m. Friday and Saturday, after which times restaurants and bars shall only offer pickup, delivery, and drive-through space. So that's the context of the, um, of the 
declaration, declaration that they're referring to. And I will say we're starting to see, as noted uh, by both gentlemen, that there are other communities around the state that are starting to um, starting to express interest and support similar resolutions, as well as there are a number of legislators around the state that are also beginning to express interest. So um, at the culmination of this conversation, should the council wish um, to move this matter forward, I'd be happy to work with legal counsel to draft um, some language in an appropriate resolution fitting for East Greenwich businesses um, that the council may consider at your next meeting, should, should you make that decision. Uh, council Donegan. Um, Andy, you might know the answer to this. Is the, um, uh, you know, absent other restrictions, uh, if you look at a lot of restaurants, even in East Greenwich, for instance, what happens during dinner hour and who's there is different than what happens at midnight and 1 a.m. You know, they become more bars in East Greenwich. Some of them become nightclubs. Um, different, much younger groups of people, probably. Um, and uh, I'm just conjecturing, I don't know. But is there, um, are you aware of why, uh, if they were all the same population doing the same thing until whatever their normal license hours are, uh, I understand the argument as to why the data, why should the data be different? Do you have any understanding of why the Department of Health made some conscious decision to pick 10 o'clock? Any understanding of the rationale or the basis for that? Um, yeah, Mike, I just think it was a very, it was a very conservative approach. I think it was at a time when uh, positivity rates were increasing, and I think they were felt at the time that ten o'clock for your average family had pretty much already culminated in dinner, um, but they weren't really targeting that group from maybe seven to to eleven o'clock prior to the activities that you refer to that might occur a little bit later between 11 and one. So I think it was a conservative approach, um, but I will say I have heard from other restaurant owners similar to Mr. Tara that are expressing that same concern on a statewide basis. And I think as you know, as a council, and as we all know, it's a continuing balance of interests of health and safety and wellness and also economic viability mm -hmm. and where you where that where that pendulum turns it can it can move just very slightly and it can have a great effect on a business like uh, like Siena uh, okay. in its different locations so um, right. very yeah, understanding. No, I agree. Uh, yeah. do you, I agree do you mind if I had a comment on that uh, yeah, Chris uh, I was just gonna say that we you know we in town have done honestly everything we can to try to make this work for you uh, and are going to continue to do that. Um, I was just wondering if if we push such a resolution forward, if you could help us with what's the pushback from the DOH and the people who say it's science and there's a rational basis for this. Have they expressed one that you're aware of? Well, and this will not be a very com popular comment that I'm going to say is that this did not come out of the DOH. This came out of Congress, this time restriction. Uh, the DOH has its other battles. I'll be very honest. They were really fighting against the bars more than the town restrictions. I've, I've been on calls with Dr. Julian and everybody there. They were much more doing that. I think ultimately what Rhode Island has a problem with, and this isn't this is you know going down a tangent, is that we don't license restaurants different than lounges that turn into nightclubs or nightclubs. Right. Because let's be honest, if you have a kitchen with a fry lady, you can say you're a restaurant. So. I understand, you know, at certain, listen, I was all for closing down everything when this first happened because we didn't know enough. And that, but as we know more, we're going to do it. But the time restriction, I think I'll, I'll say with Andy, was more out of commerce than, well, he didn't say it, I'm saying, than the health department. And they were just being conservative. And I get it. When somebody dies, you know, in Rhode Island, I feel bad, but it's not on my, my shoulders like the governor. I mean, like her or not, or, or love her or not, I'm not sure I'd want to be her right now. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's a it's a battle, but I think we're at a point where the curve has changed. And what we're saying is, okay, we didn't start this in December. We didn't start this right when she came out. We're pushing back three months later when we there's a vacuum out there with nobody talking about small businesses. Right. Chris, can you help me if if um if Rhode Island had a distinction that said that restaurants could be open until their normal closing hours with open normal restrictions but bars nightclubs were something different do you think there'd be a rational basis to limit to 10 o'clock those you know nightclubs and those kind of uses like I, I just don't know the science behind this 
Well, I think the science and why somebody does it, and be very honest, is it's all about standing and congregating versus sitting and eating. Right. So if you think of a nightclub, and I'm not saying that clubs are operating like this or not, people are in a cluster, they all pull down their masks, that's when the spread could happen. Where a dining restaurant, they come in, they sit down, and they pull the mask down. Yep. So I think they were afraid of not only, you know, and that's why there was limit, like you can't stand at a bar and have a drink because they're worried that people will come over. So I think it's all about people pulling the mask down and drinking with people that they did not arrive with versus if you come to a restaurant, you are 99% of the time coming in, sitting down, pulling down the mask, put it up. Right. So I think if you ask why they, why they limited the time, they might have been worried about the nightclub atmosphere where people would all of a sudden congregate and go to the bar and have a huddle. We've all done it. We watch a football game, spread wings, you reach over the person sitting at the bar. But we have thousands, we have hundreds, if not thousands of people going out there to enforce COVID regulations. Shanna gets, a, one of my two restaurants gets inspected every single week by chance. So it's not like they're not out there. So what I would argue is if there are people out there that are bad be behaviors, close them. Don't give them three chances, close them. You know, because otherwise, uh, and I use this, uh, uh, whatever, uh, story uh, to, to prove my point is, does anybody on this call want to be re be held responsible for another politician that acts poorly? Why am I being held? Well, some people will behave badly. Well, how's that my problem? So that's where I think, but I, listen, a conservative at first, we all get it. But now we see where the curve is going. We understand it. And there's a vacuum of people not saying, Hey, let's get these businesses open. Even Governor Cuomo today said, we're going to have to open up starting immediately. And he's been as conservative as can be. So where is Rhode Island doing the same? Mm -hmm. But Chris, so you're thinking is that the, maybe because Rhode Island doesn't have a process to distinguish sit down only restaurants from uses that later on, even the same restaurant in an evening can become a nightclub or a bar full of people that that's probably why they picked a 10 o'clock because they don't have the ability to speciate? Well, I'm not sure that they went out and said that. I think they did it more of a gut check saying, hey, you know, listen, looks like a chicken walks like a chicken. They might say, hey, it's more likely that the later places that are promoting more drinking than eating are going to have less stringent uh, guidelines or hold people accountable. And I don't think that's fair because I've worked in nightclubs where there was no underage people. There was no fighting. It was a mess. The, the food, I was so liquor for a living. The kitchen was cleaner than somebody. But I get the, listen, I get the rationale thinking. I'm not sure I agree with it, but you can understand from a gut check. Well, if we close a little early, we're not going to worry about Mr. Tower, 20 people to hitting to, over, uh, sitting around a bar. Mr. Tower, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a minute. Our solicitor is, uh, is signaling. I think he'd like to interject here. Um, yes, this is Andy Tights. Um, I think. Um, this is on for public comment. Um, we're, I, I know it's important, but we're well beyond the three minute per person and sure uh, the 15 minutes. And there isn't anything on the agenda for this at this point. <clears throat> I think this would probably be an appropriate item to debate if we had a resolution on the agenda and have public comment on it. But I, I think we have to wrap it up. I, I think so. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Tights, uh, Mr. Lombardi and Mr. Tower. We appreciate you bringing these concerns. I mean, as you know, the town of East Greenwich has, has done, as Mr. Donegan said, uh, as much as it can for our businesses. We, we, we uh, were awarded competitive grants of over $75,000 mm -hmm. to help expand sidewalk dining. We changed our, uh, our ordinances to, uh, to suspend parking and uh, capacity Absolutely. regulations. And we, we will continue to, to support restaurants and I think it would be appropriate for uh, the manager and the solicitor to put together a proposed resolution that fits the town of East Greenwich uh, and, and uh, would balance, as our manager said, those considerations for business, which we certainly are aware of, and also the, uh, the uh, necessity for public health measures to uh, protect our residents. And I think we can accomplish, accomplish that goal. So- Can uh, I- Can I-, can I, I I'd ask our manager to uh, to prepare that uh, resolution. And Mr. Tower, do you have a final comment? I just wanted to thank you all very much. Nothing about me being on this call has anything to do with you guys not stepping up. 
I would argue I'm on this call because other people aren't stepping up. So I'm sorry you're in this position, but I appreciate anything, everything you can do. And at least you heard me and that's a lot more than I can get right now. So thank you very much. You're more well, thank than you welcome. for bringing it to our attention. I really appreciate it. I, 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 uh, I, I do think it should be on an agenda, a future agenda item. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you again to our, uh, our guests for this uh, public comment. Are there any other public comments uh, at this time? I'm looking at our attendees. I don't see any. There's only one hand raised, and that's it was Andy's comment. So we'll move on now to our uh, consent calendar. This is a, a series of items that can be considered as a group and voted on together, unless one of the councils would like to pull off an item for further discussion. So on our consent calendar tonight, we have uh, item 5A, minutes from the November 23rd, 2020, regular meeting and open session. We have item 5B, elevation and appointment of Matt Yoder from an alternate member to a regular member of the planning board for a remainder of a three-year term to expire January 2024. And Mr. Yoder did receive the recommendation from the planning board chairman, Nathaniel Ginsburg, to assume that um, full-time member role. We have item 5C, this is the reappointment of Michael and Maureen Schreffler as the town's tree warden and deputy tree warden. Uh, the state of Rhode Island is one of the few states that requires that each city and town appoint a licensed arborist to serve as a tree warden. We do that every January. And the manager has recommended the reappointment of Michael Schreffler as tree warden and Maureen, uh, Maureen Schreffler, both of uh, Emmy Schreffler Tree Service as the town's tree warden and deputy tree warden. We also have item 5D. This is solid waste and recycling services agreement between Rhode Island Resource Recovery Corporation and the town of East Greenwich. This agreement will allow the town of East Greenwich to dispose of solid waste and recycling materials at the Rhode Island Resource Recovery Corporation in Johnson, the landfill for fiscal year 2022 and 2023. A copy of the uh, municipal contract is attached to our agenda and the uh, agreement was recommended for passage by our Director of Public Works, Joseph Duart. Would anybody like uh, any of these items removed from the consent calendar? If not, I'll ask for a motion to pass the entire consent calendar in one vote. So moved. I have a, uh, a motion by Councilor Donegan, second by Councilor Zarella. We'll take the roll call. Uh, Councilor Zarella? Aye. Councilor Donegan? Aye. Councilor Corenthal? Aye. Councilor Engelhart? Aye. And Mark Schwager votes aye. Motion carries five to zero. This brings us to item six, which is a report from the town manager on projects, initiatives, COVID-19 response, and public safety updates. Mr. Nada. Great, thanks Dr. Schwager, members of the council. Um, as has been the case uh, in, in recent months, there's a significant amount of information that I've provided um, for your review and for the public's uh, for the public's review. I'm gonna run through a number of the topics, but happy to pause and answer any questions that the council may have. Um, first off, uh, I'd like to say that I did follow through on a, a meeting with Governor Raimondo and the chief executives, mayors, managers, and administrators around the state um, this past week. Uh, it was more of a, a check-in, I think, where uh, she started to spend considerably more time uh, in preparing for confirmation uh, hearings in Washington regarding her new post as uh, Secretary of Commerce. Um, there was um, some limited discussion regarding transitions, although um, I think as we're all following uh, that uh, work out of not only the State House but also out of Washington, we would expect that uh, that transition will happen in that governor's seat sometime in the coming weeks. Um, um, that being said, uh, the League of City Towns, Greenwich being a very active member of that organization, is is already um, engaging not only members of the governor's staff, but also the lieutenant governor, um, soon to be governor, regarding uh, the upcoming FY22 budget process, uh, uh, as well as the ongoing uh, program that's being managed through the Department of Health and the governor's office. So there'll be there'll be much more to come on that on those topics and, and many others in the coming weeks. I think once the transition is settled and uh, any revisions are made to the governor's team, 
uh, and various posts around the state, you know, I think we'll be able to settle in and move move forward on those items. I did want to note just briefly, and I know that um, the council is aware of this, and uh, we have made some unofficial postings um, community wide. But um, we're very excited about the the new appointment of our community services director, Andy Wade. Um, Andy will be starting he's transitioning from his present position now. He'll be starting in that role on Monday, February first. Um, Andy. Uh, already facilitated meetings and, and, uh, and engaged a number of members of the staff this, this past week. So we're already putting plans in place. And uh, I'm very thankful to all of the other departments who've been very gracious and open about assisting Andy and greeting him on, uh, on his, new, uh, in his new role. Um, we've set the bar high, uh, clearly, uh, on many of, much of the work that's associated with community services. Um, and for those members in the public who may not know the scope of that operation, it includes all parks and facilities. Uh, it includes all our recreational programs for all ages in the community. Um, it's a major facilitation role with our school department on programming and athletics and school grounds. Um, it also includes our senior services program that we're, uh, we're hoping to invest some time. Uh, and once we start to exit the COVID environment, really start to make an investment in a dramatically expanded senior program for our, our harbor program. So it's, um, there's a number of, uh, of things there that are, are somewhat um, involved, uh, and I would say it goes far beyond that, also including major public events in town, as well as a facilitation role with many of our businesses, as well as takes on a role in terms of public engagement and communication. So there's a, that's a lot to swallow, uh, and I think Andy's up to the task. We've set the bar high regarding kind of where we're going to be. Uh, we've set a fairly aggressive short-term and long-term schedule. So look forward to introducing uh, him in person to the council in the coming weeks. Um, and really setting a fairly aggressive agenda as we move forward over the next year. Um, the amount of information that I've included tonight, which um, much is available if you know where to look uh, on a statewide basis, is really regarding uh, continuing to involve and deservingly so um, the state's COVID response as well as the vaccination process. So I'm not going to review all of that, but I think tonight, if you were to scroll through, if you don't, if you're not savvy in terms of navigating um, various websites to track down this information, there's a lot, a lot of good information here regarding our testing sites. We got word today that we hope to have in the coming weeks a, a large-scale testing site located here in East Greenwich, yet to be formally. Uh, formally committed, but we expect that to happen in the coming days, and that'll be terrific news. Uh, very convenient location right off of Route 2, so um, if, that, if that occurs fairly soon, I think it'll be terrific for all residents in East Greenwich as well as our neighboring communities. Um, what I did provide is an update. The state puts out a list of probably 20 or 30 resource um, links, and this has continued to change. You would think that it's somewhat static, but uh, I think some of the topics and some of the new interests and needs with Rhode Islanders, as well as residents in town, has continued to, to change and evolve over time. So I've included a list, and as you can see, as you scroll through, it's on. Um, uh, it runs through all the basic Department of Health information, uh, flu vaccines, which everyone seems to have forgotten about the flu, but um, it's still out there, but really at a much reduced rate this year. You know, a lot of testing information, a lot of multi-language uh, links for individuals um, that require um, require information in a different form, resources for the deaf and hard of hearing, um, a lot of other um, similar to the direct declaration we just spoke about in terms of impacting businesses, a lot of uh, detailed information on the pause in Rhode Island, um, support services for um, support services, including deliveries for those who are unable to get out of their home, Red Cross information, housing information, renter and homeowner help, um, co coalition against domestic violence, um, as well as um, supplemental nutrition programs, uh, as well as information about um, behavioral needs, behavioral health crisis in terms of children and other challenges that they may be facing um, and parents may be facing in, in difficult times. So it's a lot of good information there. Uh, of course, our town staff is always available to support and assist anybody if they need some help in trying to facilitate to get to the right, to the right place or to the right person. Um, something I'm going to kind of skip over, but it's all, it's relevant. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Is we did open our um, second round of our vaccine vaccination site at Swift uh, Community Center today. This is a, again a closed pod. It's the second round of six days 
We're doing Monday and Tuesday for the next three weeks. This will address somewhere between 17 to 1800 Rhode Islanders that already received their first dose, the majority of which would have received them out of our seven town region, not all, but a majority out of the seven town region that we're serving and working as partners at this vaccination site. There's some good information uh, in my report regarding, um, which I think we all understand, kind of where the state stands at this point. And I think if you if you look beyond probably some of the rhetoric and you look to the science and the data that we have, I think you start to see, you know, why there's a concern that's beginning to rise. And I think as we continue to receive 14,000 doses per week, you're starting to see the percentage of those doses that, are, that have already been utilized or distributed starting to come down. And I think that's where I think a lot of people would have hoped that that number would have stayed at a high level. And I think it's a lot of it has to do with scheduling and, and really we're in the middle of that. So as an example, um, you know, for three weeks, we're gonna be open twice a week and we're gonna issue second doses, but there isn't really anything preventing us with an active team that's in place by still dispensing first doses. So, so our region, our mid-state region, as well as other regions around the state in a very supportive way, working with the Department of Health and the countermeasures program from the Department of Health that oversees the vaccination clinics, you know, we're continually engaging them on doing what they can with um, the, that leadership in the Department of Health and the governor's office to be able to you know, actively look at ways to utilize the resources in the field that are readily available and established to be able to assist them in moving forward quickly. This past week, uh, Fred Gomes, our deputy EMA director, and I filled out a survey to the Department of Health regarding the three next phases that the Department of Health is anticipating. And I think these are phases, if you just watch the nightly news, you're going to know what they are. It's going to be those aged 75 and older. It's going to be um, municipal, uh, a lot of municipal employees with interaction with the public. We happen to be one of the few communities just based on the approach that we took that have already addressed a significant number of our staff that are engaging the public on a daily basis, but you know, most municipalities have not. So that still represents an important part of, of this next phase of vaccinations. And the final phase would be all, all of our public education and support staff in all our school districts around the state. So you know, there's no set order for how that would work. There's groups A, B, and C. And so what we did at that time is we communicated with DOH to let them know that we just had to submit the survey. So we submitted it as if we're gonna handle that on our own internally in East Greenwich, um, because we have yet to been able to communicate with some of our regional partners to see if in fact, there's any possibility of us being able to, to partner on a considerably smaller scale than the mid-state region. You know, we're ultimately a small fish in that in that pool when you're looking at Warwick and Cranston and West Warwick and Coventry, towns that are much larger uh, in terms of population size than we are. So um, we do have a meeting. Um, I had it scheduled for Wednesday. It's been pushed back to Friday with a series of other neighboring communities that have similar forms of government that may be a better fit. Um, and what we're gonna do is just informally have a conversation. We're gonna just talk it through and see if in fact that on some of these mid-stage uh, clinics and these additional groups that I just noted, um, once there's enough vaccine in the state to be able to open those clinics, you know whether or not we'll be in a position to quickly move forward. Um, I think when it comes to the point in time in the coming months when we're having at-large clinics open to the general public at large, um, most likely most cities and towns are probably going to be working alone. And I think that some of the neighboring com communities will absorb some of the very small communities, uh, some of the smaller towns that are out there, mostly in the southern half of the state, um, just, just due to the high numbers of vaccines that are going to need to be pushed out at a given time. Um, so that that's uh, quite a moving target. And I think some of the other numbers that I would really stay focused on, if you're, if you're, if you're a statistician and you like tracking the numbers, that I think, you know, as you look at Rhode Islanders age 65 and older, you're somewhere in the vicinity of about 190 to 200,000. So that's, so ways in which DOH, and this is important because I think it's really an underlying narrative that's being discussed about at length throughout the community and around the state. Um, we're starting to tackle numbers. And so I think it remains to be seen what that 190 to 200 will really look like when we finally get to the point of vaccinating. And I say that 
because the uh, joint effort of the partnership with CVS and Walgreens and DOH, which is already tackling many of your nursing homes, many of your other congregate sites, um, um, facilities in East Greenwich, we've talked about previously at meetings like St. Elizabeth's and others, um, as well as some of our housing, uh, our housing, uh, federal housing that's in the community managed by the housing authority, um, are being set up to be able to address those populations in-house, which is really um, a, tr a tremendous asset and benefit to be able to do that, to be able to service those populations without having to relocate everyone to make that happen. So by the time you push through that population on a statewide basis, you work through those that will not take the vaccine, you work through those that may not be in the state right now, might be traveling for the winter, you're probably gonna be, you're gonna be sh shy of that 190 number by probably tens of thousands, we're just not sure how many that's gonna be. So for the group of people, just for relevance, when we look at the number that we served here in East Greenwich and around the state in this initial phase, we were serving close to that same number, which was up close to 200,000, a little bit less than that. Well, you can see how long it's taken us to serve that population, just I think due to gaining familiarity with the system um, and kind of hitting our stride. What I can say to today with what I witnessed over at SWIFT um, with our partners from Warwick that were manning the site, as well as backfilled with many of our own East Greenwich staff, um, it was extremely fluid, significantly more efficient than when I think we first opened the door. So we had restricted the time interval down from 10 minutes down to seven minutes per person. And really it could have gone even lower than that if we had a larger building um, due to the fact that I think parking was starting to get a little bit tight as well as our observation areas in a building of that size. We can vaccinate faster, but we just need to have the space available to accommodate the 15 minute rest period afterwards and observation as well as the parking and to make it accessible. So. I think as we go forward, we're gonna start looking towards larger facilities because I think the point in time that comes when we need to handle our senior population, which according to the voting rules is in excess of 2,700. So that number for sake of argument, let's say it's about 2,000 by the time we get to vaccinate our seniors, that's a similar number than what we've vaccinated in our first round at the site for other, other professionals around the state. And it took us, you know, over three weeks, we could do it probably in a week this next time, but we would be handling those ourselves. Ourselves. So we're working through all those logistics right now, as well as some of the larger cities in town. So we're, we're gonna be happy to report out. Um, Charlotte Markey is sitting on a committee that is working on the vaccination scheduling for our senior population in Rhode Island through the Office of Healthy Aging. So we'll have a voice at that table um, as well, and um, and be able to get the most up-to-date up information for the council as we continue to move forward. I'm gonna pause there, and one thing I'd like to leave you with, and I'm gonna just touch on a couple of other items before I wrap up my report for tonight is, you know, as we continue to work on other business as we get into budget season, and as we look to collaborate with our school department and our planning board on many other initiatives in town, there's still nothing that's happening that's probably more important and relevant to everybody in the community on a statewide basis, as well as our seniors, as well as our business owners, as well as our families and friends, than actually trying to push out the vaccine. So we're really spending a, tr a tremendous amount of time. And I think it comes down to the point in time with significant more federal dollars being available and the, the likelihood of additional reimbursement on some of the costs that we're incurring. But still any costs that we incur are really pale in comparison to the to the value and the loss of life that we could have if we don't focus on this effort. So we're going to continue to invest time and effort in making sure that uh, we're running a very efficient um, system here in East Greenwich. I have already reached out to the Department of Health and noted for them that if they want to, if they are in a position to accelerate the dispensing of the vaccine to any of the categories that I noted, that as difficult as it will be, that you know we'll be prepared here to work with our partners to make that happen. So um, I think it's important to provide for some perspective because there's just so much information out there. Um, and of course, a lot of the negative information gets the headline regarding misuse of vaccines and people getting vaccine that should not have. And I think you know any of those examples that have happened are really have been the um, have been the outlier. They're definitely not the norm, at least from our experience at SWIFT. Um, you know, as we progress through, we'll continue to update the council. As we know, the phone has been ringing, especially at our senior center, regarding interest uh, from residents. Um, 
The other information that I provided was just, you know, where we are in terms of the week, this week of January 25th and who's getting vaccinated. It's a good list. It gives you good information, not only to the categories of the populations, but also the locations and who's really responsible for issuing that vaccine. So I think you've got a number there that really touch on the regional vaccination clinics, which of course we're directly involved in. Um, Let's see. In addition to that, I'm going to kind of break away and, of course, come back to answer any questions. League of Cities and Towns uh, just recently released a budget memorandum to the governor and lieutenant governor, touching upon a number of key topics that we've mentioned in the past, which I think are, are worthy of mentioning um, again here. Is um, One of them is on both municipal and education aid. I think we're feeling very um, good about the transition in the governor's seat and the consistency that the lieutenant governor has already noted uh, that may remain um, in place in certain areas. So at this particular point, the letter really focused on attention uh, by the governor's office on municipal aid for distressed communities, for payment in lieu of taxes that do affect us here in East Greenwich, on the motor vehicle phase out, uh, regarding education aid in terms of considering legislative adjustments regarding the percentages, the percentage of um, contribution of employers um, and by the state to um, teachers' pensions, uh, which right now in New England, we really represent the, the lowest in the state uh, where many of our, our, um, our fellow New England states um, commit and contribute 100% of the contribution to those pensions. We're in Rhode Island, we're just hoping uh, to increase the current level of 40%. So any additional, for those who are tracking, any additional increase in that level of contribution provides each community with budget relief, right? So, so that's an area. Plus the final area that we've talked about at length is really some relief from the maintenance of effort requirements on both um, the uh, through, through the Department of Education and our public education system, as well as through our library. So League of Cities and Towns has developed um, uh, a recommendation and some modifications to the, that specific legislation that they are forwarding um, to the governor's office for consideration in the coming weeks and months. So I'll be able to circle back with the council um, on that particular area. And I know that our legislators are also familiar with that issue and I and already have been very helpful in making sure that the governor's office knows that that's an important issue to us here in East Greenwich. A couple of other key topics that are coming up. Uh, one is on the potential for community development block grant funding through the state. And the town had pulled away. I've been talking to Lisa Bourbonnet about this recently. The town had pulled away from that program due to a number of reasons. And we're preparing to come back to the council in the near future for consideration to re-engage that program. I don't have the detailed information tonight, but with information that's being released on community development block grants as a, as a conduit from the federal government to the states, to the communities as a way to distribute funding, it's going to be very important as we go forward to be able to re-engage and have a system in place that's going to allow us to tap some of those funds um, should we be deemed eligible in any any of the particular categories. Um, beyond that, I think I'm going to pause there. There's a lot of good information. Uh, there's a recap with some slight modifications on other business and future agenda items and activities. Um, and I think it would just be, uh, be prudent over the next week or two to take a look at that list and follow up with any questions. So, Dr. Swigger, I'm happy to stop there and answer any questions the council or members of the public might have. I have. I just have one question. I I saw that uh, about the CDBG, um, the grants, and um, we had East Greenwich had originally pulled out of that um, under the last administration. Are we back into the? We're we're not yet. Yeah. So that that's something that Lisa and I had a meeting on uh, late last week, and we think that there are some housing projects that are coming forward that would benefit uh, funding wise in the community. Yeah. Um, by participating. And then I think by not, uh, this is clearly one of the existing conduits of federal funds that's being used that doesn't have to be recreated or created anew. So yeah. I think it's uh, it's important for a number of different reasons, but I'd rather Lisa and I try to articulate that and boil it down so that we can we can show and, and communicate with you the benefits to being re-engaged in that program. And I think what you're going to find on a lot of uh, particular programs, we're probably not going to be eligible in this mm -hmm. community based on a lot of different reasons. But I think as you as you look through that paragraph, you're gonna see there are multiple rounds that are coming out. 
The first is about low and moderate income housing. The second deals with basic needs programs, food security, job training, renovations to public buildings, community centers, et cetera. Could be a possibility there in round two. Um, and then it comes down to round three, which is more specialized, like potentially statewide broadband access. So so I could see, you know, if you read between the lines, I think there's a couple of opportunities there. And we would hate for our neighboring communities to be able to benefit from a program and East Greenwich miss out being in the middle. So I think it's important that we're in the game and at least eligible. So we'll circle back Renew, with everybody on that. I think it's I think it's important that we probably re-enter that program. Okay. Thank you. But. Other questions for the manager? Uh, Andy, just a quick question. In, in your participation on calls with municipal, statewide municipal leaders, has there been any discussion about uh, transition of different phases or restrictions on commerce uh, at those meetings, at those municipal administration meetings? Uh, we're talking about the dec the emergency declarations that are well that I, are I limiting think, yeah, commerce or right the, the executive orders which are limiting um, commerce which would apply to to restaurants gyms um other uh other areas where there are restrictions on hours of operation and and capacity those types of things mm -hmm. yeah th there is dr swager I, I would say it's a mixed bag i think it depends who's on the call at the given time and whether or not it's a call that's just involving municipal officials, or it's a joint call that also includes all the state agencies and they're reporting out. So I think those are the calls that you may um, have to have more, um, more active dialogue on those topics. But I can say it's been fairly quiet during this transition over the past two or three weeks. So no timeline that you're aware of in no. those municipal calls? No, no. Kind of yeah, I, I think from from the seat of, I understand um, what was talked about earlier about commerce, but clearly DOH, DOH has an impact on those policies that are being uh, put into place. And I think that there is some science behind the congregation and the gatherings. Um, but I think it um, since this is a first time for everybody, I think sometimes policies and restrictions like that are just developed by people sitting around a table. So I think that there is room for opportunity for that to move and evolve. And I, I think it's important that, it, that everybody, that it stays a fluid conversation and adapts as we're adapting to our COVID environment and, and the vaccine being rolled out. Because a, a point to your question is, you know, there is yet to be a lot of discussion regarding those that have been fully vaccinated, you know, in terms of travel and things of that nature. So clearly the policies are lagging a little bit behind. I expect to see those come out fairly soon. But even in establishments, you know, there's really no recognition yet about what do you do with somebody who comes in and has the credentials to show that they have been fully vaccinated, even if they've got their mask on and they're being protective. Um, do they still fall under those same restrictions or not? So I, I think it's going to take a little while, probably. And as you know, those are those are difficult things to reconcile with the general public, where some are going to be vaccinated, and some are not. Some have access to services and facilities, some don't. So I think it's going to take time for the state the agencies to be able to reconcile those differences. Well, some of it is just waiting for the science to catch up with the uh, the state of of current events. Uh, you know, we we really don't know the protective nature as far as uh, whether the vaccine protects uh, people from transmitting the virus, it protects them against right. active infection symptoms, but they still may possibly be able to transmit it. And also now we have some new variants and the, the effect of the vaccine on some of those new variants. Again, we're just going to have to watch and wait. The science is always going to be a little bit behind the public's demand for knowledge and information. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Swigger, I had one more. What's one more thing? I've got, um, yeah. I'd like to just note the work of our town clerk and executive assistant, Lee Carney, in terms of we secured another 36, almost $3,700 in support of our upcoming um, election on uh, March 2nd, special election uh, on the various state initiatives. So we'll take, uh, and this was through our Secretary of State, Nelly Robea. So uh, we're pleased to get whatever financial support we can. To uh, to be able to host this second uh, the second election this year, and that just uh, Lee just received this uh, notice this past week. Great hey, work, Lee. thank you, Mr. Donigan. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure where Andy was going with that. I think he was suggesting that we could have like COVID only uh, vaccinated only restaurants and clubs. <laughs> um, but uh, assuming that's not where he was going, Andy, um, if if we're going to consider, and I think we will, it sounds like um, a some version of a resolution supporting 
perhaps a change in operating hours. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm left with a lot of anecdotal evidence on how I would, how I would uh, kind of handle that. And I was, I, I would like to know as we discuss it, what the state's position is on how they drew the line and why. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we have the daily download, but I was wondering if you could use your uh, considerable talents to at least get some response or some shape that in some way, because otherwise I, I just don't have the science and the argument to weigh that out very easily. Yeah. Um, I think then we're just being what you described earlier, a bunch of people sitting around a table deciding whether 10 o'clock works or midnight or eight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think these policies, Mike, it's really people are using the best information. You know, they're all smart people that are making yeah. these decisions, just the mm -hmm. best information, most up to date that they have at the moment. And as we know, uh, it's moving so quickly and it's changing so quickly that as we learn more, these policies should all be uh, updated and changed quickly. So I'll, I will, I will do what I can to provide for a substantive response. I'm not sure how substantive it will be, but there are some resources that I have that might be able to drill down a little bit deeper than, uh, than what we covered tonight. That'd be great because I'm sure they thought when they, when they picked the time, somebody gave some justification for it. Yes. Whatever that is would be helpful. Thank you. you it's bet. just hard, you know, when you don't have as much science as you would like, you end up relying on expert consensus. And That's so true. expert consensus is, uh, <laughs> it's by its nature, somewhat subjective, but, uh, you know, you can't have a number of different bodies uh, addressing the same public health measures. You really have to decide who is the, uh, who's the ultimate referee. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, thanks, Andy. That, uh, as usual, a lot of information there, and we appreciate your uh, bringing us up to date. Any other, if there's any other questions? Uh, we'll move on to our public hearing portion of our agenda tonight. Uh, and tonight we are uh, taking up the uh, public hearing continued from January 11th. This is the annual renewal of alcoholic beverage licenses. Uh, some of these businesses have ancillary licenses uh, for the period December 1st, 2020 through November 30th, 2021. And I'll ask our clerk to read through the uh, complete applications and then we can vote uh, to approve any applications that are complete. And any applications that are incomplete, we'll ask our clerk to maybe take them individually and give us a little introduction as to the status of those applications. And then we may have the applicants on the line who can add additional information. So Ms. Carney. Okay, thank you. So what you have in front of you is um, seven remaining establishments. And if you will uh, recall from our last meeting on January 11th, the way that the motion was crafted uh, was that if any of the any of these had come into compliance by last Friday at noontime that I could go ahead and issue the license. So I have done that for four of them. So I have issued licenses based on their full compliance to PB Bistro, Raku Sakura, C. Filippo's Twisted Pizza, and the Waysider Grill. So I don't think any additional action is required on the council's part since we took care of that at the last meeting and I have taken care of confirming the compliance and, go, and issue the license. So now we are dealing with um, three, uh, the, last, the last three, which is Circe Restaurant, uh, Frank and John's Pizza and Revival. And basically where we are with Circe is that they owe a very small amount of town taxes which during this meeting, I have received an email from their owner stating that he uh, was apologetic that he had just received my message later, later on this afternoon and that he would be in tomorrow to, to pay off uh, the past due taxes owed to the town. It's very, very small amount, like under $300. Uh, Frank and John's is in a similar situation. Um, uh, Another small amount of town taxes is still outstanding. And the only other one is revival. Um, um, they are still not cleared with the state division of taxation. Now I see that, um, I don't think Cersei is going to show up on this call and I 
don't see Frank and John's, but I do see Mr. Lowry. And he did call me first thing this morning to address this issue. So um, that's kind of where we are right now. I'm not sure um, how you want to proceed with that, President Schwager. Uh, Mr. Zarella, do you have a comment? You said uh, both are under $300 for their town taxes? Uh, Frank and John's is around 700. Andy, are we allowed to approve it if they owe taxes to the town? I know we're not allowed to do it if they owe taxes to the state. Not really. Um, this is Andy Tights. Um, I don't think you can approve it. You can only do what you've done is continue the approvals subject to when they pay it. Um, what we've generally said, either pay it or they have to enter into a formal payment plan, um, but they can't be officially delinquent on it. So you could continue the approval and allow the clerk to issue it once they do pay it, but you cannot actually issue it tonight without the money being paid for a formal payment plan. So we could continue this two weeks, issue the license contingent on them paying the town? Yes. Okay, I'd like to make that motion. For all three or just those two? Just, well, for all three, the other one is taxes owed to the the state. state. Right. We, yeah, I'll make it for all three. Do we want to take okay. the state uh, issue with Mr. Lowry separately, maybe let him speak? Because we don't really have control over the state's uh, clearing of his certification that he's paid his state taxes. Uh, so why don't we take um, the two local taxes that we do have jurisdiction over? And uh, Mr. Zarella, would you like to make, I'm sorry, would you like to restate that motion? Yeah, I would uh, vote to approve um, them getting their licenses subject to them paying their taxes. Um, then, in addition, they can ha uh, be allowed to serve in any, what do we do, how do we do that? Allow them to serve in the meantime or? No. Well, I mean, th that's up to you. It's up to you whether you want to allow them to continue. They have been allowed up until now, everyone has as you've continued it. Um, you can allow them to continue to serve or not. I would, vote that, I, mean, I would move to allow them to continue to serve and then review this in uh, one month. Uh, uh, how about the next council meeting? That, that's fine. And if they do not uh, comply by the next council meeting, are we going to offer another extension or will the licenses expire? I think we could decide at the next meeting. Um, I mean, it sounds like they have very small amounts of money. So I would assume they're paid, but we could tell them it might not happen next time. Yeah, I think we do need to set a final date. I mean, this is, we are going to be into, into uh, February and these were due November 30th. I, I agree, but it's also been COVID. So I want to give people a little break on these things. I mean, it's been a long time. I don't disagree with you on that. Okay, Mr. Zarella has, uh, has made a motion. The only question I have uh, for our clerk is, do these uh, applicants have other licenses also in addition to the alcohol licenses? Yes. Applying. Yes, as listed on the agenda. And do they do they uh, all run in tandem, or uh, you know, would, would the all if they do not meet the obligations, all of the licenses would expire? The billing license as well. It, it's up to it's up to you. Um, you could renew, you could renew the victual the victualing and entertainment and other licenses without the the alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, that's or you you know you could. I would think you couldn't suspend the vic the vittling license. That's something that's pretty much independent. There, there has to be some misconduct before you mm -hmm. could do that. Um, but um, so the, I mean, we tend to issue them all together, but you can consider them separately. Just like you could revoke an entertainment license without necessarily revoking a liquor license. Okay, uh, Councilor Carnthal. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a little confused. What? If we just don't do anything, don't we just can't we just roll it over to the next council meeting? Do we have to do something? Yes, uh, you have to do something because you voted at the last one to extend it to this time. So we can't so just if you vote do nothing. Again. Their licenses expire today. Oh, okay. So we and they have to apply for new liquor licenses from scratch. So we can vote to extend it. For another two yes. weeks, I guess. Yes, essentially, you're granting them a two-week license. You're granting them a temporary license 
you don't you're not granting it for the whole rest of the year you're granting it for the next two weeks okay and if they come into compliance in the meantime they can get and it then you'll issue the complete one yes yeah. um, Lee, uh, neither of those applicants are on the call uh, on the zoom platform tonight no they're not okay this is a uh, public hearing is there any members of the public any member of the public who would like to address the applications for uh frank and john's or circe I don't see any public comment. We have a motion from Councillor Zarella. I'll look for a second. I'll second that. Councillor Engelhardt. Mm -hmm. Second, so we'll take a roll call. Councillor Donegan. Aye. Councillor Zarella. Aye. Councillor Engelhardt. Aye. Councillor Korenthal. Aye. And Councillor Schwager votes aye. The motion carries five to zero. So we now have um, the application from Revival Kitchen. We do have the applicant uh, Peter Lowry on the line, and if we can promote him and he can just give us an update on what's happening with uh, with Revival. Mr. Lowry, are you there? I am here. Yes, good evening. Thank you for seeing me. So it appears that the only remaining obstacle for your license renewal is the state uh, tax correct. payment. Can you update That's us correct. on what's happening with the, the status? So I, just, I have um, December's December 2020, you have to pay both my sales tax and my um, meals tax. And, um, you know, if I had done this one, it was supposed to be done in, in um, November, then it, December wouldn't be an issue. But now because we're into January, December is now the issue. So I need about two weeks time to get it paid. Um, shouldn't be a problem to have it done by then. I really don't even... I feel bad even asking you people for this because the town, like everyone has been talking about, has just been so great to all of us in getting all these things done for us. And uh, it's just been, it's been tough, but things are better. I will say that. So, you know, all I'm asking for is another two weeks. I'll get it done. And before that two week meeting, um, you know, Lee should be able to hand me my license because everything else is in, is in, uh, you know, is up to date. Mr. Dye, you okay. see, I don't. So, will Andy Tights will will paying it actually get the certificate from the state, or do you, does that take time? Yes and no. I mean, <laughs> it will take care of it. It does take somewhat of time from the state. Um, I don't think they've been too bad. I think I think the state uh, officials realize that this is uh, an important thing. So it's not something that will take a month for them to do. It may take a couple of days from whenever it's it's paid nice before people. it gets to us. That's so, my understanding that it's 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 pretty immediate now. They have a yeah. an online tax portal. Right. So when 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 folks are made whole, they just go in and do a quick update and it shows immediately uh, on the tax portal. So it's it's a very quick process. My understanding is that they do a clearance daily. So they review uh, anyone that's not cleared on a daily basis. And if they see that you're up to date with what you're supposed to be, then they clear you that day or the next day, so. Okay, so it's possible that we could, if you make your payment, you'll have evidence that that happened from the state and then we can issue a license within two weeks. Is that what you think, yes. Peter? Yes, absolutely. Peter, how long do you think it's gonna take before you make the payment? Um, it should be done by this week, by the end of the week. Okay, so you should be all set in two weeks then? Yes. All right. Well, I will, I will make the same motion of continuing his license for two weeks, uh, subject to him coming in, and then um, the town clerk could grant it if everything's in order. We have a motion, and we have a second from Councilor Corinthal. Uh, this is a public hearing, so members of the public can weigh in now if they want to comment on the license renewal um, for revival. We don't see any comments, so we'll call the roll. Councillor Donegan? Aye. Councillor Zarella? Aye. Councillor Cornthal? Aye. Councillor Engelhardt? Aye. Councillor Schwager votes aye. The motion carries five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Lowry. Good luck with getting that done, and then we'll have the license approved. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, all of you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to uh, 
item number eight, unfinished business. And I guess I just wanted a big good night to uh, Carol Malaga. I guess you're off duty now, so thank you. Thank you, good night. Uh, good night. Thanks, so Carol. our unfinished business, uh, item 8A, an ordinance uncodified entitled Intermunicipal Agreement Ordinance by and between the town of East Greenwich, Rhode Island and the town of Coventry, Rhode Island regarding Crompton Meadows stormwater drainage. So this goes back a ways. It was originally introduced in 2019 to allow an agreement between East Greenwich and Coventry to protect the interests of the town of East Greenwich in the event of a failure of the stormwater management system serving Crompton Meadows development project. The project is located in Coventry, but the stormwater system is located in East Greenwich. We did hold a second public hearing on October 15th, 2019. Uh, the town of Coventry ultimately did not agree to this intermunicipal agreement, and East Greenwich was able to obtain enforcement capabilities against the developer through a consent order entered in the case brought by the town in uh, Kent County Superior Court. Because of these, these events, the ordinance is no longer necessary, and our solicitor recommends denial of the motion at third reading. So I'd ask our solicitor, uh, Andy Tights, if he has any other comments related to this, this motion. Um, no, thank you, Mark. Um, Mr. President, you've described the situation succinctly, and um, this is just housekeeping. We just don't like to leave these things sitting here on the list forever. So if you would, uh, I, I would request a motion to deny, um, and then that way it can be just permanently removed from the calendar. Having worried this problem from my time at the planning board years later, yeah. all the way through to today, I will make that motion. The motion to put this to rest is made by Mr. Donegan, <laughs> seconded yes. by Council Corinthal. We'll take the roll. Uh, Council Corinthal? Aye. Council Donegan? Aye. Council Zarella? Aye. Council Engelhardt? Aye. Council Schwager votes aye. The motion carries five to zero. Your shoulders are a little lighter now, Mr. Donegan. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, this brings us to our new business calendar. We have uh, a few items here. Uh, item 9A is appointment of a regular member to the planning board to fill a vacancy for the remainder of a three-year term to expire in January 1st, 2024. And we interviewed a candidate, Matt Renninger. This was, the interview was on uh, January 11th. Uh, Matt is currently serving on the Affordable Housing Commission. So I'd ask for a, uh, uh, a motion uh, to fill this position of the uh, regular member of the planning board. Uh, okay. Council Corinthal? Yes, I'll move. He was great. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to fill this position uh, with uh, Matt Renninger, uh, who was interviewed Last council meeting, so I'll take a roll call. Uh, Councilor Zarella? Aye. Councilor Donegan? Aye. Councilor Corinthal? Aye. Councilor Engelhardt? Aye. Uh, Councilor Schwager votes aye. I guess, you know, we can do these as a group, but I guess I'll just, I'll run through them quickly. Uh, Actually, Dr. Schwager? What's that? Uh, can you do B and C together? Because I am going to recuse myself because my wife is on the juvenile hearing board. Um, I don't think it's a conflict, but I don't want to look like I'm appointing anybody to the board that my wife sits on. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, well, so Councillor Zarella will be recused. We do have uh, two other appointments. One is the uh, alternate member of the Juvenile Hearing Board to fill a vacancy for a term, one year term to expire December 1st, 2021. We did interview uh, Michelle Prince Scott, who um, is an attorney with experience representing young people in family court. Uh, well qualified to fill that role. And we also have the appointment of an alternate member to the Juvenile Hearing Board to fill a vacancy for the remainder of a one-year term to expire December 1st, 2021. That was filled by Adam Scott, who I think we interviewed back in September or October. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Scott's been a 20-year professional educator in the East Greenwich school system, been involved in a number of community uh, projects, including coaching, and he's very well known for his work on the Best Buddies program uh, in the school system, and it would be a, a real asset to our juvenile hearing board, I think. So I'll look for a motion to appoint uh, Michelle Prince Scott to the juvenile hearing board and Adam Scott, uh, uh, Adam Scott to the, uh, is that a full, that all to the alternate member of the uh, juvenile hearing board. Uh, Council Corinthal makes the motion. 
Yes, they were they were both great. And they'll be great. And we need a second. I'll second. Counselor they were great. Donegan. Scott's fabulous. He'll be great for the kids. So thank you for the motion and the second. Uh, we'll take a roll. Councilor Donegan. Aye. Uh, Councilor Cornthal. Aye. Councilor Engelhart. Aye. And Councilor Schwager votes aye. So we have two new members to the juvenile hearing board. And Mr. Zarella can unrecuse himself. Uh, our next order of business is uh, item 9D. This is a request for three months extension due to continued COVID state of emergency for the final issuance of a new class BB alcohol, alcoholic beverage license with Vittling and entertainment for low key cafe and lounge at 205 Main Street, which is effective through April 12th, 2021. Uh, the council had previously approved a new license for low key in January, 2020 on a granted but not issued basis for a period of one year. Our town clerk is requesting that the council consider a three month extension to allow the applicant to complete renovations and comply with building and fire marshal requirements. Uh, Lee, do you have any other comments on that, uh, that motion to extend their uh, granted but not issued license? No, I don't, I don't think so. Just briefly, I know that um, the applicant is on the, the Zoom with us and he has been trying to make steady process progress um, with, a, I think, a complete renovation of the space. I know that he's been working with Ernie and Steve Hughes. There's a building permit that he needs to, com he needs to comply with and finish and also an electrical permit that's out there that expires at the end of April. So he's been keeping in touch. He's been um, great to work with. And at this point, I think it would just be kind of um, counterproductive to let this expire. And based on uh, the pandemic and the state that, you know, business that we've all been um, dealing with, that it would be appropriate to give him another couple months to, to see if he can wrap it up. Very good. Uh, who, is our, who is the applicant who is on the, uh, on the call? Uh, Zach Flanders. Yes, Mr. Flanders, if you would like to make a comment, uh, I see that you're here and if we can promote you uh, to the uh, participant well, panel. I, think I unmuted. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for hearing my request and uh, a, a big thank you to Lee. She's been wonderful to work with. Um, as we all know, uh, COVID has been tough on all of us over the last year. Um, when I first came in front of you, I, I had no idea that uh, this would happen and I'd be seeing you again asking for a request, but um, things turned out the way they did. And um, I paused for a bit, not not knowing if um, uh, what the situation would be with uh, restrictions and whether um, I should continue, but I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, so I've been continuing work for, uh, several months now, um, and we're, we're buttoning up uh, everything we need to. Uh, so the final things, once uh, all the equipment is in, all the decorations are done, um, I, have, I have to have the building inspector come in, the Department of Health and the fire marshal. Um, and they want me to do that uh, about two weeks before opening. So I just want to be safe and have uh, enough time to get everything wrapped up, uh, be COVID safe, and hopefully um, some of the restrictions will also have um, been uh, lifted a, a little bit um, so that I'm, I'm opening up at a, a good time, not, not opening up for, for failure, basically. So, um, but again, thank you very much uh, for hearing me. Thanks, Mr. Flanders. Are there any questions for uh, Mr. Flanders while we have him on the line? Uh, if not, I'll look for a, a motion to approve the extension uh, through April 12th, 2021. So moved. Mr. Donegan uh, makes the motion. Karen Corenthal, Council Corenthal makes a second. We'll call the roll. Uh, Council Corenthal. Council Donegan. Aye. Councilor Zarella. Aye. Councilor Engelhart. Aye. Councilor Schwager votes aye. Good luck, Mr. Flanders. Good luck, Zach. Thank you very and, much. Uh, Spring is coming, and uh, Mr. Nada's vaccine machine is uh, is operating in uh, in the gym there. So hopefully we'll wonderful. Make progress. Great, thank you very very much again. You're welcome. And stay Good safe. Luck.
Uh, this brings us to item 9E under new business. This is a discussion of an ongoing progress within the East Greenwich Police Department uh, on the 20 for 2020 pledge and commitment to equity in policing and training and community initiatives and activities pertaining to social justice and diversity. Uh, this, this report is a follow-up that really started last summer and was galvanized, unfortunately, by the graphic video of the death of an unarmed black man, George Floyd, uh, which, which really culminated a series of, of events that really shook a lot of Americans. Uh, and many Americans took to the streets to protest racial injustice in the use of police force and the larger issues of structural racism in many American institutions. Residents of East Greenwich, like other communities in Rhode Island, in Rhode Island and across the country, participated in public events uh, in our community. At that time, the East Greenwich Town Council discussed at a public meeting how our town could participate in the local response to institutional racism by looking at issues of opportunity, equity, and diversity in local government. Equity and inclusion are possible only when barriers are acknowledged and removed. And it's not easy to make change. It requires an ongoing process. In support of that effort, we asked our town manager to review community activities in East Greenwich, both public and private, involving the town's professional, governmental, educational, and pastoral communities that are focused on fairness and justice, especially pertaining to civil and legal rights. Tonight, our manager will review some of these community activities and introduce several speakers to give their input on racial equity in law enforcement and community services. So I turn this over to our town manager, uh, Mr. Nada. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Schwager. You know, I think as the council and community can remember back and um, summarized by Dr. Schwager in that introduction, you know, it was really earlier uh, this past summer, uh, probably in the month of June, that a number of activities and incidents around the country, regionally and locally occurred that really spurred us to, to focus and, and really pause for a moment, focus our attention on, on the issues of equity, social justice and diversity. And what we did at that time, although uh, it's, it's not an initiative that has a beginning and an end, it's one that just continues. And I think what I can say to you this evening is that we have a, an awfully long way to go. Uh, so I'm not really here tonight to report out that we've we've accomplished something, a fait accompli, and we're and we're wrapping up our efforts. You know, I think we've really only just started to scratch the surface. Um, what I, what I've done for tonight is I think the topics and the impacts on a broad scale, which um, it's like it's like how we manage the municipality. Most people in the community focus on the things that affect them only, right? They don't look at the whole program. It's like one given department focusing on their area of expertise. But we, when you put these topics together of equity, social justice, and diversity, it really is an extraordinarily broad topic that affects our community and our organization in so many different ways. So what I've done tonight is, is brought together some comments and in summary form in a, in a memorandum, again, just scratching the surface. What I've also done is brought together um, two individuals that are really um, at the epicenter of, of really leading and facilitating conversations and some actions in particular areas affecting diversity, social justice, and equity. So that the first person is someone um, that I think we're all very familiar with, and that's Bob Hodling. So Bob um, wears many, many different hats. And what I would say tonight, I've really expanded Bob's role just through default, you know, you always have members on your staff that has have areas of expertise. Um, some have areas of extra interest and some some just know when it's the right time to step forward and kind of be involved in those discussions and those difficult conversations. And they're able to navigate them in a very uh, respectful and supportive way. And I think, you know, Bob is clearly one of those people. So, you know, Bob today for the town really manages our substance abuse prevention mental health, and really now our diversity programming. So I, I, whether Bob knows it or not, I've expanded his title and his role and responsibilities. I'm sure I'll hear about it tomorrow from him or at about 7 a.m. In, in a morning call that he leaves me. It's typically a message each morning, so I'm sure I'm going to hear it from him tomorrow. But, you know, something that um, would probably also say thank you 
to me for actually expanding his role and, and recognizing the good work that he's doing in this particular area. The other thing I commented on uh, in some of the narrative is some of the professional information. You know, there's a lot more information out there that I think is extraordinarily valuable to us as an organization. Because at some point in these conversations, and Bob talk, and I talk about it on a weekly basis, there is separate. There are things we can, can control and we're directly responsible for, and there's other societal and community-based initiatives and, that need need to be organically grown and evolve from our community and from our community members. You know, but when it comes to things that we are in control of, so something I've been working on with Rose Emilio, our HR director, is really focusing on some of those personnel practices and policies that would help establish long-term policies so that we're not as reactionary as we tend to be at times, but that we really focus on things that may not always be um, on the forefront to ensure that you know we're providing for appropriate diversity that's representative of our community, that there's equity in the process, um, uh, and that there's justice really to everybody that's involved and protections afforded to all of our employees and the residents that we serve. So, you know, that being said, I provided some information on ICMA and their original uh, national board statement that they came out with regarding systemic racism. I really felt that some of the statements that the ICMA uses, which really is a national organization that supports the town uh, council manager form of government. The process that we have happening here in East Greenwich is really the mission and the focus of that national organization, really an international organization. So a lot of times what the efforts that they put forward really resonate with me as, as an official and a capacity working in the environment that really they're, they're focused and targeted uh, towards. The second aspect really comes down to um, our local law enforcement. And I think that that's a topic that many of us have heard um, about and really, uh, and many times our local law enforcement officials are cast right into, uh, in a very volatile way, um, incidents and reactions to um, statements about diversity and equity and bias and, and, and all of the other negative connotations that go into um, their jobs on a daily basis and how they try to tackle some very difficult situations. So I've been communicating with Colonel Brown um, over the months uh, on an off basis and asked the Colonel to report out tonight on a number of different things because I think there are many things happening in the law enforcement world in Rhode Island and even here in East Greenwich that are probably lost on people. Is it a perfect science? Absolutely not. Do, are we all human and are there cases where individuals handle themselves inappropriately and may do or say the wrong thing? Yeah, you can you can guarantee that that's going to continue to happen at times. All we can do is establish a baseline through leadership of the colonel and myself, make sure that the department staff uh, recognize some of the, the standards that we're going to hold them to. Uh, the employees need to understand that they're going to be held to that standard. And I think that we're, we're both very pleased with the work of the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association, as well, as well as the Attorney General's Office on starting to break into that Officer's Bill of Rights and really um, a document that probably needed to be revisited some time ago, um, but in a very fair and equitable way, establish new practices that are going to fairly treat law enforcement officials who are in those situations um, and I know it makes it makes me feel much better, and I know it does for the colonel as well. That some of the uh, some of the adjustments being made, I think, are going to positively impact the law enforcement field. So the chief's going to report out on some of the progress and some of the areas of the 20 and 20 pledge, which is really a commitment by um, all municipal police departments in the state of Rhode Island regarding a commitment to equity in policing. I'm going to talk about the annual training calendar. I know that's something that community members are not closely tied to, but there is annual training that our offices go through. We do ramp up at times and the, the topics are cyclical based on uh, the various challenges facing departments on an on a, on a annual basis. But the department has gone through fairly recently aggressive bias training in their work, as well as other things. Talk about transparency a little bit, also give you an update rel relative to where the state stands right now to body worn cameras. So I think you hear that typically comes up in a lot of these cases. Uh, there are times when there's actually footage involved. There's a lot of times where there's not. 
So there's going to be some policies and recommendations from the Police Chiefs Association and the Attorney General's office in that respect. I think as we go forward, it's an investment that all cities and towns have to make. So I think um, we're hoping to work collaboratively uh, through economies of scale on a statewide basis to be able to start to put those practices into place in the in the near future. Chief can also provide us with an update on the accreditation process and on some of the potential changes to that uh, the law enforcement officer bill of rights. So um, that's a lot of information. We're going to try to keep it fairly tight. Um, we did have one cancellation where Bob was going to have um, um, Michaela Shunny, uh, high school junior, who was one of the co founding members along with a number of her uh, fellow classmates with the ASAP program, which is a program that uh, Bob's gonna talk a little bit about. And so there's uh, plenty of opportunity to have Michaela and others come back before the council at a future date, or maybe at our next update uh, to provide us with a little more information there. But Bob will cover that for tonight. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there um, and uh, like to bring Bob on, uh, on the call where he's gonna spend some time just talking on a town-wide basis kind of where we are in a number of these issues. Bob's gonna also provide an update on a lot of other related events and activities that are happening, not all uh, town driven, town professionally driven, but that are happening organically throughout the entire community. And he'll wrap up with some discussion on the ASAP program. Bob also provided in your packet some some interesting um, information regarding um, the connect connectivity of some of the uh, race issues regarding prevention efforts and substance abuse challenges. And so I'm going to turn it over to Bob and uh, see if he can kind of tie that all together for us tonight. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Council, for engaging in a really important discussion. Um, I, first of all, I also want to thank you. And Andy, you will get the seven o'clock call in the morning regarding the title. But uh, this is a really important uh, discussion. As everybody knows, you know, race has been an issue in this country for many years. And as I begin to describe some of the initiatives that the town is involved with and maybe some of the issues and concerns, I think it's imperative too to recognize that equity inclusive of race also includes other issues, wealth distribution, also some LGBTQ issues and concerns. And I might be, um, elucidating a little bit upon those issues and concerns. Um, the coronavirus in many ways has exacerbated that condition. And I think in, to some extent, some of this not so much has falling on, fallen on me because it's an issue that I think that we all should be looking at, but just in terms of, in terms of substance abuse, just in terms of mental health, statistics abound indicating that those individuals who have been marginalized or on the fringes are significantly impacted uh, mental health wise, significantly impacted substance abuse wise, uh, and their ability often to receive services. And so the coronavirus has taken a difficult issue and concern and even placed additional emphasis to that. And while ostensibly it doesn't look like we have significant variances in race here, we do have individuals who are in a myriad of conditions or positions, LGBTQ, some racial is issues, some financial concer concerns, that that is exacerbated by COVID and evident in and of itself. Now, before I go off on a big tangent and talk about a million programs, it's imperative to let you guys know that there are many people in town who take race very, very seriously. And there's some significant work being done by our faith communities. For example, uh, Temple Torah Yisrael does phenomenal work. They partnered a few years back with the Muslim con community and uh, the Christian community and created a program called Abraham's Tent. So a number of our religious communities, and that was designed to reach out to our Muslim friends, to create bridges of understanding from people from diverse backgrounds. There are other people in our faith communities. Um, and I could go on and on, and I feel bad because I'll probably actually miss people, but Christ Church does some fantastic work 
I know that Pastor Linda Forsberg does unbelievable work addressing uh, diversity, addressing mental health. And as many of her people of her congregation go into Providence and uh, people from our local church go in and help people in need. On top of that, our schools have tried to do a wonderful job. They're, they're looking at augmenting some of their curriculum to branch out and make it a little bit less Eurocentric. I know that they've allowed us to establish some clubs in the school, and I'll get back and speak a little bit about ASAP, but also clubs that address the LGBTQ community and address mental health. On top of that, um, there's a number of groups and organizations. The Rotary Club over the last year featured programs that dealt with diversity where they brought in tribal historian Loren Spears from the Narragansett tribe who, and Bob Geek, who's a local historian, where they spoke about the first Rhode Island regiment that all too often, when you guys get a chance to go back into town hall, right across the street from town hall, General Varnum was responsible for creating the first Rhode Island regiment that was comprised of African-American slaves and indigenous people. And they actually fought here at the Battle of Portsmouth. So we have, we got a little bit of a jump start on some of the diversity issues. So I just wanted to elucidate a little bit that there are a number of people who take race and equity very seriously. I know that there were a number of Black Lives Matter uh, marches and rallies that Dr. Schwager alluded to a little bit earlier over the summer. Andy, uh, the town manager, was also, also a participant where a number of high school students gathered um, in the field, in Back of Swift Gym Academy field, to discuss race, discuss and to create a document um, with which they actually presented to town officials, that they actually presented it to myself, to Mr. Nada, to the superintendent school of schools, reflecting upon some of the issues that they see pertaining to race. So again, before I go off and talk about a compilation of some of the things that I personally am involved in, there are tons of things. Again, another person, Christine, uh, Christine King from the Interfaith Counseling Center does some wonderful, wonderful work. There are some good things going on. There are a number of people that realize the cogency, the immediacy, and the importance of this issue. And we, just, we have a long way to go. This is, uh, I don't wanna say it's America's first sin, but to some extent our relationship with African American populations, our indigenous people. Racism is something that pops up over and over and over in our culture and it can get divisive, but it's also something that we need to continue to create bridges for. And that's one of the things that I have tried to highlight with some of the initiatives. Uh, the town manager Nada had mentioned a little bit earlier about a program called ASAP and ASAP is comprised of East Greenwich High School students. And these students originally uh, spent most of their time promoting mental health, promoting, trying to get rid of some of the stigma that surrounds mental health, uh, substance abuse. But obviously as time went by, a number of the kids began to uh, identify other factors that continued that impacted mental health conditions, and those were inclusive of LGBTQ concerns and race concerns. And these kids have done a phenomenal job offering trainings, speaking to adults, going into elementary school classrooms, trying to enhance a level, a level of acceptance. We've been involved in a number of walks just on uh, MLK Day, a number of young people and adults were involved in a day recognizing the importance of Martin Luther King, but more important, recognizing the important of importance of creating bridges that link people together. So that ASAP group is also a group that, you know, they one of them was saying the other day to me that they've grown up in an era right after 9-11 
right shortly right after 9-11 and during this time they, they witnessed the Parkland shootings, they witnessed the coronavirus crisis, and now they've witnessed um, storming of our capital and they've seen a significant amount of racial strife and they thought that because of the world that they grew up in, they made a lot of equivalencies to the 60s about some of the tumult and some of the acrimony and some of the angst that was going on at that time. And so these kids have gone, gone out and become significant social activists. Again, I'm sure you have this, um, a list of things that we're doing in the town. And I said, it, it's a work in progress. I think we've spent a lot of time trying to give people an opportunity to voice issues and concerns. We've tried to give the high school students and younger people opportunity to interact with people of diverse backgrounds. The youth to youth program that I'm involved with every summer gives kids from the East Greenwich High School an opportunity to go to Bryant University for four days and hang out from the kids that come from all over the Eastern states Matter of fact, the last conference we had, we had kids that came from South Dakota on the Indian reservations. We've had a number of kids that come from way up in Maine all the way to the inner city parts of New Jersey, inner city parts of Philadelphia. And it's a real unique opportunity for our kids to pre be prepared for a world that when they go off to college, they go off into the military, they go off into the work world, that they are interacting with individuals, have, have different viewpoints and different stances. Again, I think the biggest thing that I can advocate for is opportunities for people to sit down, opportunities to speak. We've taken a number of high school kids to the mit mixed magic theater which is a theater, it's an all black repertory group and they've gone to see presentations uh, like Fences that was, that was turned into a movie. They've gone to see presentations about Maya Angelou and there are tons of things that they've done but I think the biggest emphasis that we've tried to do is just to in initiate a top, um, the topic, give people an opportunity to talk about it a little bit keep it in the, you know, at the forefront, acknowledge that we have a lot of work to go. To, to go. And again, it, it's a work in progress. But I think if, if I end with one thing, I just wanted to let you know that there are a lot of people who take this serious. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of players involved. We in East Greenwich in many ways, you know, are not as diverse in terms of race that you know as many other communities are and but i also think that within that racial breakdown there are other issues and concerns inside as well again the lgbtq community issues of uh poverty issues of mental health the stigma that goes around uh, stig uh the stigma around mental health so i think that we're doing some good things we've initiated some good processes we have some pretty good partners um, working with the police, working with the schools, working with the churches, working with other departments in town. We have some good pieces, but I think again, like uh, town manager Nada was saying, we have a lot of work to do. We have, we have some holes in our game, but I think that uh, we're going in some decent directions, but at the very, very, very least, we're willing to talk about it and start that discussion and do some soul searching and reflection. Uh, I just want to uh, pause for one second. I, I know that there is a, uh, a hand up uh, and we will be inviting attendees to make some comments, but uh, why don't we uh, have our speakers talk first to have them remain on the line then we can open it up to the council and to the public to talk a little bit. Uh, Mr. Hummeling, uh, do you have any, are, are you uh, complete, completed with your remarks or do you have anything else that you want to, to bring up? For round one, <laughs> no, I just wanted to give you a little overview of some of the stuff that we're doing, some of the support we have in the community and also the fact that we've got a lot of work to do. Well, I think you've, you've really set the stage very nicely. I think you've spoken very eloquently and I, I like <laughs> your idea of partners in the community 
and you mentioned the uh, the faith community, educational community, the Rotary, uh, young people in the community. And I think you and your office are another partner. It's, East Greenwich is very unique in having someone in your position who can act as a liaison between many of these partners. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Nader, do you want to uh, have uh, Chief Brown come on now and then we can uh, kind of open it up to a little more interactive? Yeah, session? you bet. Yeah, Colonel Brown. The, the floor is yours, Chief. I think I'm on. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Welcome. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Council, and thank you, Mr. Nada. It's been quite a while since I've uh, been in your presence. Uh, tonight, I'm going to report out on seven areas that the department's been working on um, in relation to our, our pledge, uh, 20 for 2020 pledge and other uh, department initiatives. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, transparency and, and public concerns. And one of the things we've uh, beefed up kind of with this is uh, we've updated the police webpage um, to include a transparency tab where the public can go on there. They can view our use of force policy. Um, and there's also several links and information there if the public needs to file any concerns or complaints with the PD or any other agencies, those links are now on there where they can easily access um, forms to fill out and file. Um, the second area that we're uh, working on uh, diligently and uh, moving forward with is the uh, Body Worn Camera Program. Uh, this was another one of our pledges. Um, We've, the department has signed on with the uh, Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association and the Attorney General's Office to initiate this program. Uh, the Rhode Island Police Chiefs Association is currently in the process of securing a vendor for the statewide bid. Uh, and the Attorney General's Office is working on identifying a revenue stream to fund the program statewide. Um, I will say that Attorney General uh, Nerona uh, believes very strongly in, in body-worn cameras. He's a big proponent of that. Um, he, he has been personally involved uh, right from the get-go, and he's uh, really working hard to uh, to get the money. And, and you know, I, I think he will. Uh, the Attorney General's office will come up with the funding um, to get this off the ground for all the departments in the state. Um, we, as the department, uh, you know, have spoken on it at the last staff meeting. And we're excited actually to uh, implement this program. We look forward to it. Um, the third area is that the accreditation program. Uh, we continue to move uh, pretty rapidly forward uh, towards the final accreditation process. Um, we've implemented most, if not all, of the state accreditation standards into our policies, and I'm mostly working on training and physical things like the evidence room and storage. Um, and of course, of course, we uh, remain hopeful that this process will lead to full accreditation in, in uh, this year, 2021. Um, the fourth area is the interlocal trust. As you know, the department is now a member of the Rhode Island Interlocal Trust, and as such, we have access to other training opportunity, opportunities provided by them, such as the use of force simulator that provides our officers with scenario type exercises in use of force decision making. Uh, the trust also requires all of its police department members to be accredited and stands as a valuable resource during this process. Uh, the fifth area is training. Um, as uh, Mr. Nada had previously stated, uh, we have uh, just recently updated our yearly training calendar. We do this every year in January, um, January 1st. And uh, this year um, we went ahead and we, uh, we outsourced uh, a training service called Police One Academy. It's an online training service that we're now using to uh, supplement our, our, our training. Uh, this, this service will broaden our training resume and allows for short and directed training modules that can be completed by our officers while on duty. Uh, some of the training we'll be covering over the next year includes use of force, constitutional law, implicit bias, bias-based policing, ethics, leadership, communications, arrest, search and seizure, bullying, stress management, medical distress, mental health, performance management, officer liability, autism, anxiety disorders, 
domestic violence, the LGBTQ community, and supervisor skills. The sixth area, the sixth area that we've uh, that we're currently working on is bringing in some outside speakers to engage uh, with our officers. Um, we're we're going to be looking to to book. Hopefully, as we move through the, this COVID experience, we'll be able to bring some people in. Um, but we, we're, we're looking to book some outside speakers to come in and engage with our officers on a regular basis on the importance of understanding and engaging with the diverse public. Uh, we've actually done this before. Uh, Bob Hodling set us up with a friend of his from Chicago who came in. He put on two very, very good sessions uh, for our guys uh, probably about a half dozen years ago. Uh, but it was very well received by the department, and we uh, obviously learned quite a bit from that. Um, and finally, the seventh area, as Andy touched on earlier, is the uh, statewide task force that was formed uh, over the summer by the state legislature to look into and recommend changes to the state's law enforcement officer's bill of rights. Uh, that body has actually issued its final report and forwarded their recommendations to the legislature to initiate changes in the law. Um, and that's it. That's that's pretty much uh, just a summary of the, the major things that we've been working on. Thank you, Chief, for that update. I hope our speakers can stay with us. Uh, Mr. Nada, do you have any other anything else you'd like to add? And no, I think that there's so much more to this conversation, uh, Dr. Swager, that I think we're, we'd be happy to to report back and, and make it more of a, a, a constant update. You know, every so many months, bring back uh, not only Bob but uh, the chief as well, as well as a number of other people that are extraordinarily active in this discussion on a community-wide basis. So I'd rather open it up to questions and see that the council may have or members of the public that are actually on the call. And I'm sure it can take a lot of different directions. So what I want to, I think we're prepared to do that now, if, if that's where you'd like to go. Sure, thank you. Uh, why don't we give the council a, a few minutes and then we'll go back to the public and we can go back and forth for a little while. Uh, council Kornthal. Yes, hi. Um... Let me, let me address um, Bob first. Bob, as usual, you're doing uh, unbelievably outstanding work. Um, I just wanted to uh, discuss two things. One, um, the wonderful speaker at the inauguration, Amanda Gorman, the um, poet laureate. Uh, there are many um, programs associated with her speech. There are lesson plans associated with her talk. Uh, if anybody is interested in them, I can, I can put you in touch with some of them, but that's really outstanding. Um, the other thing is I recently, just last week, had a discussion about Black Lives Matter with somebody, and I think it's really important to state the terms and define the terms because People say to me, um, well, all lives matter. And I say, and I think you really have to define that Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that other lives don't matter. It just means that the Black lives are the ones that are in trouble now. And that if you're against racism and brut brutality, that you support Black Lives Matter. It doesn't mean that blue lives does, doesn't matter, but I, I hear that quite often. And I think that that should be stated like front and center. Uh, as far as uh, the police chief goes, I recently heard, I think it was on National Public Radio, a discussion about the police. And one of the um, points in this research study that they did is the police seems to be do, need to do a better job recruiting and looking into the background of the people that they're recruiting, recruiting for the police force. For example, making sure that we don't uh, hire people that uh, have been convicted or, or have domestic violence in their, in, or for that matter, any violence in their background. And they said that that is one of the big things and sometimes some drug issues as well. The other thing is, I often wonder, and my husband's a psychiatrist, so maybe I sort of lean that way, to think that when you go on um, some calls, 
maybe you're better off bringing a psychologist, a therapist, a social worker with you rather than a police officer. And I just wonder if the, I know you said in one of your, um, your things you're working on is that you're working on um, dealing with training and force and constitutional law on mental health. And I think that's really important, but I wonder how important you think it would be to have, you know, somebody really trained in that. Um, so that, those are the- Can I- uh, yeah, Sure. Yeah, can, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a great discussion. And, you know, uh, one of the things, I don't, I'm not sure a lot of people realize, we, are, we have a, a mutual, uh, uh, a memorandum of understanding with uh, Thrive Behavioral Health. I'm not sure if you're familiar. I think they used to be the Kent Center. Yeah. Um, but we actually have a, a clinician, a mental health clinician that works out of our police department like three times a week. Um, and he's there for eight hours a day. And he actually goes out with our patrol guys when we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, substance abuse issues or mental health issues that we go out. And he actually goes out and, uh, uh, you know, handles a lot of these cases with us. And he, he is a certified clinician, so he's able to, uh, you, you know, uh, get people committed into the hospital when they need to do so. So he's been very beneficial. And that's a that's kind of like the start of this program, like you're speaking about, Karen, is, uh, you know, bringing in mental health professionals and having them right on the front lines with us. It's, it's, we found it to be very, very beneficial. Right, great, I think that's great. I just, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to both Bob and to Chief Brown for showing up. And I'm very pleased to hear about the progress made um, by both sides. I mean, by the diversity issues that Bob is looking at, also some of the issues that uh, the police chief is looking at, especially I think in the area of the mental health as Karen spoke of, especially in autism and implicit bias. I think these are issues that, you know, I do see the calls that the police department goes on in this town and people don't seem to realize this department gets a lot of calls that are not necessarily police related, but maybe more mental health or domestic related calls. And I think that, you know, we have a lot more, there's a lot of calls that uh, the department probably needs help with that and people are calling for things that are not necessarily emergencies in that type of way. I think the police department does an excellent job with what they have, and I, obviously they're improving on it. And um, I was not aware that they were using Thrive, and uh, they had a clinician in the, their office. But I think that's a great, a great thing to hear. And um, you know, I, kudos to both, both the chief and to Mr. Hodling for recognizing some of <clears throat> that are coming up. So thank you. Renew, if I if I could just add something that we were just saying, another thing that I, I'm very I think the town should be very proud of, and I know that tonight you just uh, installed two additional members to the juvenile hearing board. Uh, working with the police, working with members of the community, we have long felt that early intervention, supportive services, recognizing that people made mistakes, but getting them service and, and embracing them back into the community is essential. And if you can hit those eight, when you're, if you support youth and their families when they're 14 and they develop longitudinal relationships with those supports, that can alleviate some problems down the line. So I think that sometimes some of the work that we do don't e doesn't even manif manifest itself that would go all the way up to the police department because there has been some interventions that are a different type of police work that have proven to be exceedingly positive. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, especially I think like the SROs and yeah. at the high school, I mean, my kids loved, you know, the, I think it was Officer Al at one point and then, um, you know, Steve Branch and my kids love them. So yeah, I think there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes that people don't necessarily see right off the bat. Councilor Donegan. So first, um, you know, when we first asked uh, Andy uh, as a council, we asked him, you know, we're confronted with the, all these issues that uh, uh, are really demanding greater attention across the country. 
And so we asked you for help. You know, we, we want to make sure that we have our house in order, that we're moving forward, that we're hearing, listening, and taking some action. Um, you know, it, it wasn't surprising to me that you turned to Bob to help out. Um, and Bob, thanks so much for all that you've done. Andy, uh, you know, what did surprise me was I, I didn't expect to see you on Facebook and everywhere in town with Bob <laughs> doing all of this. And I wanted to thank you for that because it really does start at the top and that's you. And so thank you for that. And, and you guys have been a great team. We also asked, it's kind of a harder question, right? You know, we wanted to hear from the chief and chief, thank you for coming and, and providing, uh, you know, really the concrete steps that you have taken and led to try to address some of the uh, concerns that are very real, even in our uh, sort of homogeneous community. Um, and so thank you for doing that. Uh, I think that, you know, Andy, as you indicated, this is a continuum, this isn't a start and stop. Uh, we, we, need, we won't be arriving there in any meaningful time frame in the future, but we have to keep moving. And so if you could put this kind of an update on some regular scheduled agenda, that would be great. Um, and I don't mean every six months. <laughs> so maybe once a month we could hear about this. Um, I, I would like to follow up with the, um, you know, with the chief. Chief, you mentioned um, it's great that if we can get our accreditation, I know you guys wanted that for a long time and that took some town support to do it and the freedom to do it. Um, I'm glad you guys think you can do it in, in 2021. That'll be a big help. Um, uh, two things. One is I wanted to echo uh, Karen's uh, comment about the mental health professionals as uh, sort of part of the police force. Um, you know, when I, I have three kids in college and one in graduate school, so we have no end, I get no end of education on, on what we should all be doing. Um, one of the things on the defund the police conversation is uh, my graduate school student was telling me she doesn't mean they don't mean defund it. They mean refund it. They mean reallocate resources. And she'll tell you a lot about how in Europe uh, they classify the calls before they respond. You don't have to send an armed person out for a domestic dispute that might not call for that. Or if it's a different kind of a social circumstance, uh, you can send a different sort of professional. Uh, she indicated that they have uh, all trained in social work kind of as a priority and police work as the collateral benefit. In any event, if, it, if you think, Chief, that more support from us in that area would help you in some meaningful way restructure how we do it, I, I would like to hear that and I'd be open to that. Uh, yeah, uh, so interestingly enough, uh, we're seeing more like the, the program I uh, was explaining to Karen with Thrive. Um, we're seeing more and more of this uh, across uh, departments across the country, not just here in Rhode Island. Um, that, you know, interestingly, it, uh, several years ago, there was a push to train, uh, you know, police officers in depth in mental health. And then they would go out, they would, you would have two or three of them in your department and they would ride out on a shift and they would handle the mental health calls. And then I think some of the mental health agencies like Thrive said, hey, we, you know, we can do that. And I know speaking to um, uh, Thrive when they approached us about it, they they were getting a lot of the, the money to finance this on grants, government grants. So, uh, you know, I, it, it's going to be interesting to see in the near future if this is going to be something that, that takes off in, in, in that stream. In other words, that we, we would get support through these private uh, organizations to bring in their people. Um, it, it's, it's been a beneficial program to us. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know anything about the mental health profession. I, I, you know, I just have the minor training that we've had in the department, but I wouldn't even know how to get a program like that off the ground. I don't even know what the cost would be for something like that, but it would be very interesting to see down the line in the short term, if this is something that could, could take off from the private sector and they could assist us. So, so chief, the good news about the request is you don't have to worry about the money at this moment. <laughs> That's our problem. I was just wondering if as, as the way you deliver the services to the community and we develop 
kind of appropriate responses. It's easy to think of it in terms of the force continuum, right? You're all trained in how to do that. But yeah, if yeah. before you get there, there's a continuum as to who you send, you're a lot less likely to have to make a call about that. So right. uh, anyway, right. I was just, I, I know you, when you mentioned that you're not trained in that, that's precisely what may be beneficial to do as we move forward with everyone, you know, to have, yes, you know, maybe 10 years from now, our police won't be saying that. And yeah. if we can and, and, it, and understand it, uh, it would be, you know, I know that'll take some time for you to look out into the world and see how these models might work wherever they are and to come back to us. But, you know, from my perspective, I would appreciate you working with Andy, giving some thought to that and then coming back to us just so we at least know what our options are. If we think they can, such changes could be impactful. Right. And the last thing I'd like uh, to understand chief is I was, um, you know, I thought when you went through all the different training modules and speakers who would talk about the different issues such as, you know, race, bias, awareness, force continuum, uh, you know, all of the, you know, how you recognize autism and respond appropriately, how you do all of that is important. If, but I don't know how, is there a way you could get back to us as to who's actually taking these trainings? Let us know that they're happening and what they are so that we can see concrete steps are taken, not just that they're available, but they're being taken. I don't want to, you know, no, so it, just anything you could do to help us understand that things are moving forward would be helpful. Yeah, so everybody takes the training. They have to take it. Um, that's one of the reasons why we went with the uh, Police One uh, Academy, the module, because it, it's it's all monitored through them. Uh, yeah. Once you log into the course, you have to finish it. Um, you can you can go in and out of the course. It's 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 time stamped, but you can get in and out of it. You can pick up where you left off. Um, but then it's all, it, it, you know, it, it, it's all logged in and the accreditation officer, Lieutenant Brian Clement, he monitors all the training. He makes sure that everybody finishes, you know, he'll put out two or three train. These are the, the police one Academy. They are usually about an hour long training sessions. We'll do like four of those a month. Um, so he'll put out the, the notices. You'll get an email. The guys have to go in. They have to finish the tra training. It's all logged in. And then he monitors anyone that's, you know, been on vacation or anything to make sure that they, they catch up and do the training. So um, these so are all, these are all, not optional. Right. Okay. So the officers will get yeah. all of those these, modules you described? Right. These are not optional. These are all trainings that okay. you have to go through. Oh, thank you. Um, yep. Chief, I'm going to pause you there for a minute. I appreciate that it's a good conversation that's going on, but uh, the council gets paid the big bucks to be on these late night meetings, but some of our members of the community are really hanging in there and uh, I appreciate you waiting. So I see there is a hand raised and I want to give the community an opportunity to uh, comment if they'd like to. I know Nicole Bucca has had a hand raised. If, if we can uh, promote Ms. Bucca, let her uh, say good evening to us. Good, good evening, Nicole. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Welcome to... Uh, to the town council meeting, please uh, let us know what's on your mind. You have to unmute. You're on mute. Um, hang on, they asked me to unmute. Oh, so um, I wanted to, you can still hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, I had to you unmute again. Um, I wanted to applaud, applaud first of all, the, the town council and the town manager for having this agenda item on the agenda and to continue having it. I think that alone is great progress. And I appreciate the updates um, from Bob. There's many programs and relationships um, that I, I was not aware of. So this was very helpful to me. And I also appreciate the way Bob extended the, the um, description of diversity to include groups like lesbian, gay, transgender, queer, you know, the, um, a broader definition of diversity because, you know, given that our, our population is relatively homogeneous, I, I think that there are many groups uh, for whom that they are diverse in this community, but maybe are not treated the way they should be treated. Um, I also wanted to thank Chief Brown. Um, I did not know about the 20 for 2020 campaign, so that's also something I learned about. I am the daughter of a police officer and the sister of a police officer. So um, I definitely have great respect uh, for the career. 
So, you know, one of the first things I wanted to say was I would really encourage the town and um, us as a community to define and extend what we mean by diversity. Um, and this is not to undermine that race is the primary um, element of diversity that we need to focus on. But I also want to recognize intersectionality. So many of the national examples of police brutality, which are not here, they're national, um, many of them were not only people of color, typically male people of color, but they were also people that often sounded like they were on the spectrum or had a mental health condition like anxiety, had their face covered. And I definitely have noticed over the years in the police reports, which, by the way, have gotten better, um, that, you know, oh, someone was acting oddly. You know, we kind of have this this idea that if we sense they're acting oddly, it means there's something wrong and that somehow we're not safe and we're going to call the police. So I would just encourage you, um, you know, I consider when I think of diversity, I consider it um, with regards to ability or disability. I consider class. Classism is pretty rampant in our community, I believe. Sexual orientation, um, appreciation for a variety of religions and political views. So I wanted to... Um, so I wanted to say that, and I think that um, a lot of the Black Lives Matter, you know, again, it's still really about race first and foremost, but that when you're also, you know, many times they're Black and might have a mental health or a disability and be poor, right? So you see how the intersectionality is really critical to think about. Um, I have engaged in something called the Anti-Racist Challenge um, from the Anti-Racist Table, and I would really strongly encourage Everybody here, the town councilors, the um, town manager, the um, Bob and um, Chief Brown and the police, um, you know, the, the main premise of the anti-racist challenge is we cannot change something in our community that we have not really confronted the history of in our country because we've been educated in white norms. Like everything in our community, everything in our education system is white normative. So we have to go through this challenge, which basically takes us all the way back in history and looks at the research and the data um, and experience. So I'll just I'll just sum it up real, try to be quick. You know, I spent most of my life in Southern California. I think of myself as a pretty progressive person. This challenge has taught me that I never recognized somebody, you know, in the challenge, somebody said, well, what does your whiteness mean to you? And I was like, I, I've never, I don't, I don't know what that means. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to be white? And they were like, you don't know what it means to be white because you have privilege. There's no black person that doesn't know what it means to be black. And these are the kinds of aha moments I had in this challenge that have really helped me. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, regardless of what programs and relationships and one hour trainings we might have for our police and anybody in our community, if we don't look inward first, right? If we don't first recognize what, what ethnicities and identities and races and abilities we represent, then we really can't do better by other people. Like you really have to start inward. So I'm almost done, I swear. The next question is, what have we done to, to dismantle systemic racism in East Greenwich? And I, I wanna say that this is a big question. Like, so here's some examples of things I would love to see more than just Chief Brown and um, Bob work on, okay? Um, in the schools, if you go to the SurveyWorks data, there's a little icon that says groups and you can actually disaggregate all SurveyWorks data on school climate by groups like race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, et cetera, you will see very clear patterns um, that there are very marked groups of parents, families, and kids who do not have the same experience in East Greenwich as other kids. So that's one area. We talked earlier, somebody mentioned, I think it was um, Renew, I, the, about SROs. I have had a personal experience, if not one, more than maybe more than one, where SROs in our school systems uh, had a child with a disability having a meltdown, and it was handled with some force. So I just want to say that SROs being better trained and know the kids with disabilities is has been a historical issue. And then also talking about um, affordable housing. Again, remember, race goes along with often socioclassism, right, as well as disability. And I think a lot of times when we talk about affordable housing, I definitely sense racial overtones of if it's going to have to be here, we want it to be very few, we want it to be the elderly. Why? Why? 
And if you took the anti-racist challenge, I think you would start to grapple with some of those really challenging questions that that conversation had overtones of race and we're just finding a different way to package it. Thank you for hearing me. I appreciate it. On the call, I, I'm glad you hung in there because your comments are just so uh, well thought out and well expressed. And I, I, I thank you for bringing that to our conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I see, and, and this will be an ongoing conversation and I hope you will attend in the future. Uh, I see we also have uh, Johan Potlock has his hand up, would like to make a comment. Johan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you and I believe I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. You're coming coming in Perfect. loud and clear. Please, uh, Great. please let us know uh, your thoughts. Great. Yeah. So, you know, I also want to thank everybody for being here and for having this conversation. Um, you know, I think it's uh, it's been building up for a long time, and you know, it's it's good to be here at the official meeting and and talking about it. Um, I also really want to thank Nicole for uh, going first and asking a lot of the tough questions that uh, that I had lined up as well. Um, you know, I I want to echo what what Nicole said about anti-racism as a as a concept here. And, and I think this was a new word for a lot of people um, over the summer. Um, and I think, you know, anti-racism got a little bit muddled in, in, in some people's minds, maybe with anti-fascism and what that meant in terms of political groups or people that they saw in, in news footage. You know, but anti-racism is, is just the, the act of not only uh, avoiding racism, but also actively, as Nicole pointed out, trying to dismantle some of the structural issues here. Um, so what I want to say is, you know, I, I really appreciate all of the all of the the council members um, for you know their their personal statements in the summer for showing up in support of uh, Black Lives Matter protests um, for asking some really fantastic questions today. You know, I I agree. I think I think doing this sort of reading and doing these sorts of anti-racist challenges is great for each individual. Um, but I also want to direct a little bit of a question at the town as a political entity and, and ask what the town can do uh, in terms of anti-racism. You know, there was a lot of discussion at the very start of this meeting about a, a resolution, a town resolution about opening hours and closing hours for restaurants in the midst of a pandemic, which I think, you know, it's a really important issue. Uh, but, you know, there has not been much discussion about a town resolution uh, addressing matters of systemic racism and equity. So there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the need for community engagement and for this to happen organically and to sort of bubble up from the community. And I think there's, as Bob pointed out, lots of things that bubbled up from the community, but those things are not necessarily the town's business and they do not exonerate the town from engaging actively with this as an entity. So the town of East Greenwich has been around here for a very, very long time. Um, and you know, the, the, the systemic racism that has gone to create some aspects of why this town looks the way it does have been here for a long, long time. And we're talking centuries. Um, so, you know, many, many times in this conversation, people have pointed out that EG is not as diverse as other communities. Uh, I've heard the words homogenous community. Um, people are saying that the the diversity we have here is along many lines, but not so much along uh, matters of race. And so the question is, is that truly an accident or is that a coincidence? Or are there historic structural reasons why East Greenwich looks different from Warwick and Cranston and Providence? And I think it behooves the town as an entity to look into what those reasons are and whether there are things that the town can do now today to offset uh, some of those historic drivers of inequity. Um, just very concretely, one thing that came to my mind today is we were talking about vaccine clinics. And so EG is a hub for vaccine clinics for a number of towns. That means that residents of East Greenwich have very easy access to our vaccine clinic, but residents of Cranston, for instance, have to travel somewhat. Now it's not that far, but in Rhode Island terms, that is still a distance to travel. Uh, 
and that means that a burden is being placed on communities that may be more diverse uh, in favor of communities like East Greenwich that have more resources. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to move the vaccine clinic, but it means that somebody needs to take point on thinking very hard about whether or not the vaccine clinic right now is generating equity issues, either in vaccine distribution or the burden of getting the vaccine and access to coming here. I view that very much as the town's responsibility. And so I have been thinking about anti-racism in terms of things that the town should be providing to its citizens. So I take it for granted that the town will provide firefighting services. We have a paid professional firefighting department. Uh, they're fantastic. We have a paid professional law Yay, enforcement department. And, and, and we pay our taxes and the town uses that money to make sure that those departments do their job. So my hope is that the town will also engage with anti-racism in the same way and view this as a basic fundamental municipal service that should be provided to its citizens, rather than classifying it as something different that should somehow be treated elsewise or turfed out to faith-based organizations or uh, school-based clubs or such things. So again, I really appreciate this and uh, hope that everyone can engage uh, on an ongoing basis and I'm happy to uh, be uh, engaged in that process in any way that I can be of help going forward. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, you are uh, also very well spoken. Obviously, you put a lot of thought into uh, to this subject and your remarks and, and they're, they're, they're thought provoking. And I think that's what the council wants and that we're open to. We want to uh, to hear new ideas. We want to uh, review new ideas. We've got a lot of talent uh, in our town administration and also in our community. So this is uh, very helpful to hear community input. So thank you. Uh, members of the council. I, just, I was just going to say, I think these are important things. Uh, obviously, there's a need to have a further, I think, to Mr. Donegan's point, further conversations about these issues and some of the concerns that both um, Nicole and Johan brought up, I, I think obviously there's just a need for an ongoing conversation. And obviously, you know, these are important things to talk about in the town. So I thank them both for coming forward. Actually, they brought up some great points. Uh, Mr. Nada, can you comment uh, on the um, League of Cities and Towns annual meeting? Uh, it's coming up, I think, this week, and there's going to be a, a session related to um, institutional uh, racism, uh, social justice, some of these other uh, ideas that have been brought brought up by our speakers and uh, counselors and some of our public uh, comments as well. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Swigger. Um, actually, Thursday, pretty much running all day, it's a virtual conference this year, uh, convention. Uh, it's the one that's customarily held at the at the crossings and is just widely attended, really, by uh, many municipal officials and uh, support staff around the state. But there is, there is a session at uh, 1030. Um, I don't have the background detail on it, but it talks about promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in local decision making. And I think that speaks to some of the points that several residents just made regarding not being blind to um, decisions that can routinely be made that may not be fully looking at the impacts of those decisions. You know, something that Bob had mentioned, and I think uh, Nicole might have mentioned as well, is, um, is also one of the follow-ups that we hope to have is with representatives from our school department to talk about curriculum issues that they're facing. And then we expect um, there to, to indirectly be a conversation on this at our joint meeting with the planning board when we talk about housing, right? We talk about growth controls, talk about diversity and housing inventory. And I think all very, very relevant um, to the same conversation. So <clears throat> I'm actually very interested in sitting in and learning a little bit more about that session, which will be this Thursday at 1030. It's uh, the convention is free really to anyone. So if, if somebody needs a link to be able to get in, just let me know. Uh, but I know a number of the town staff have already registered to participate in a number of these conversations. Right. Councilor Kornthal. Yes. Um, 
Andy, maybe you could address, I know, I, I think I'm correct that um, the vaccine was given to uh, Central Falls because they had so many cases. So I think they distributed it there, but he, but he makes a very good point in saying that, um, you know, maybe some other communities aren't, it won't be as, it won't be as easy for them to get the vaccine, but I don't know if that's, you yeah. want to address that a little bit? Cause I remember. Be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, no, we happy. agreed to spend the money, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, be, be happy to, be, be happy to address that. So this first round, so I think, that's it's so it's very challenging because there is so much information and people are gathering it in so many different sources and a lot of times it doesn't really support each other based on what what channel you're listening to. So this was a closed pod just for professional healthcare workers, right? So we're one of a region of seven. There were five regions set up throughout the state of Rhode Island. So this was not a population that was going to be challenged in any way, shape, or form to be able to get to the clinic. We utilize the resources of East Greenwich not to make it more convenient for our firefighters that also live around the state to be able to access the vaccine, but because we have the professional expertise and the facilities to be able to dedicate that to support our, our, other, our other partners. What I would say as we now progress, and I talked about it a little bit earlier tonight, as we progress into the secondary rounds where each community is gonna be addressing their senior population or the teachers or their other employees who live and reside in those communities. And then when we work into the general population, I can guarantee you that those communities, as we're already seeing happening with um, our senior and uh, those residents that utilize congregate housing, you know, the vaccines are being brought to them. Uh, and that's happening on a statewide basis with our partnerships with CVS and Walgreens. So I, I think as you go forward, that that is um, uh, front and center. And I think Central Falls is a great example. Uh, those communities densely populated with very high pos positivity rates are being uh, prioritized to be able to have uh, vaccination clinics set up in those communities to address that that exact point that Johan actually mentioned. So um, I would not, don't be misled by what what you may or may not know of what occurred in this first round. It was high level professionals in the field, healthcare workers, hospital workers, first responders, who it was just felt to be very critical that uh, the regions were set up. These were different regions. These are not seven counties in Rhode Island, right? These were regions that were constructed for a particular purpose. And I think we addressed that purpose and we're just about done. So I think, I think you'll start to see it uh, more mirror uh, the image that uh, Johan was noting in that it'll really be brought as close to populations that may need that for convenience and access. Um, uh, it'll, it'll be done on a statewide basis that way, or at least that's the plans that I've been uh, expressed, that have been expressed to me from the Department of Health. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we've, we've really generated some very good discussion here. I, I'd like to start to bring it to a close. Uh, if our uh, speakers, our guests, have any uh, maybe comments based on some of the conversation we've had, Mr. Hodling or Chief Brown, uh, and then if there's any closing remarks by the counselors, we may want to turn this back to the manager and, and have him uh, synthesize a lot of the conversation and then we'll come back and, and do it again. So Bob or, or Chief Brown, uh, anything that you'd like to add before we finish up tonight's conversation? I, I just wanted to say that I thought this was a healthy a healthy start. I think we brought up some things that are not comfortable. And I think that you know the other day when I was speaking about Martin Luther King, sometimes change can't be comfortable. And sometimes to engage in conversations that cause us to reflect and cause us to maybe look at some inherent uh, ways that we viewed the world for a long time and at least at the, be open to, to to look at them and change them and maybe look at some of the advantages or the biases that we grew up with. So I think this was a healthy start. I think that we've got some good pieces, uh, but I think we have a long ways to go, but I, I really appreciate being able to be part of something that we're looking forward and we're looking forward to making some viable changes. We got some work to do. Thank you, Bob. Are there any closing comments from the council? 
Good. Well, this was a good start. Uh, Mr. Nana, thank you. I, I, I know when I got your um, memo related to this conversation that it was apparent that you had put some time, effort, and, and thought into this. And so that was reflected, I think, in the quality of this conversation. So thank you. And we'll be having you uh, continue your work and, and come back and continue this conversation. Very good. So thank you uh, for uh, council comments and also for the public and for our guests. So I'm going to move on to item 10. This is public comment. This would be an opportunity for people to make comments that were not addressed on the agenda tonight. Uh, if they'd like to do so at this time. I don't see any hands uh, for public comments. So then we'll turn it to council announcements and comments. If any of the councilors would like to add an item that was not reflected on the agenda tonight. Mr. Donegan. Um, I don't know if Andy tights, if this needs to be added to the agenda. Uh, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, the four council members and two of our lawyers attended a three hour Zoom hearing at DEM today on med recycler. Uh, just to let you know that that happened, that we participated. Andy, does that need to be added? I don't intend to discuss anything else. No, if, if, if no one's going to discuss it, I don't think it has to be added to the agenda. It's, that would do as an announcement. Thank you, um, Councilor Donegan, for the update for the public. And there are two items on executive session one of which does pertain to a med recycler, the other for uh, approval of minutes. So I'd ask our town clerk to please uh, read the motion into the record to bring us into executive session. Thank you. Uh, motion to convene into executive session per Rhode Island General Law 4246582 a for the approval of executive session minutes from November 23rd, 2020 and remain in executive session per Rhode Island General Law 4246582 a pertaining to litigation, specifically East Greenwich versus Med Recycler, KC 2020-0498, EAD appeal number 20-002 slash ARE, and PC 2020-07066. Someone like to uh, make the motion? Councillor uh, Zarella makes a motion to go into executive session, seconded by Councillor Corinthal. We'll take a show of hands, all those in favor. I see five hands, so the motion carries five to zero. So we'll be leaving this platform, signing in on a different platform for executive session, and when completed, we'll come back on to report out the results of the executive session and to adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>